111, Chapter 4, From Resentiment to the Bad Conscience, Number 1, Reaction and Resentiment. In the normal or healthy state, the role of reactive forces is always to limit action. They divide, delay, or hinder it by means of another action whose effects we feel. But conversely, active forces produce a burst of creativity. They set it off at a chosen instant, at a favorable moment, in a given direction, in order to carry out a quick and precise piece of adjustment. In this way, a repost is formed. This is why Nietzsche can say, the true reaction is that of action. The active type, in this sense, is not a type that only contains active forces. It expresses the normal relation between a reaction that delays action and an action that precipitates reaction. The master is said to react precisely because he acts, his reactions. The active type, therefore, includes reactive forces, but ones that are defined by a capacity for obeying or being active. The active type expresses a relation between active and reactive forces such that the latter are themselves active. We can see, therefore, that a reaction alone cannot constitute resentiment. Resentiment designates a type in which reactive forces prevail over active forces, but they can only prevail in one way, by ceasing to be active. Above all, we must not define resentiment in terms of the strength of a reaction. If we ask what the man of resentiment is, we must not forget this principle. He does not react and the word resentiment gives a definite clue. Reaction ceases to be acted in order to become something felt. Reactive forces prevail over active forces because they escape their action. But at this point, two questions arrive. Number one, how do they prevail and how do they escape? What is the mechanism of this sickness? And conversely, how are the reactive forces normally active? Normal here does not mean frequent, but on the contrary, normative and rare. What is the dem definition of this norm, of this health? Two, principle of resentiment. Freud often expounds a schema of life that he calls the topical hypothesis. The system which receives an excitation is not the system which retains a lasting trace of it. The same system could not at could not at one and the same time faithfully record the transformations which it undergoes and offer an ever-fresh receptivity. We will therefore suppose that an external system of the apparatus receives the perceptible excitations but retains nothing of them, and thus has no memory, and that, lying behind this system, there is another which transforms the momentary excitation of the first into the lasting traces. These two systems or recordings correspond to the distinction between the conscious and the unconscious. Our memories are by nature unconscious, and conversely, consciousness is born at the point where the mnemonic traces stops. We must therefore see the formation of the conscious system as the result of a process of evolution at the boundary between the outside and the inside, between the internal world and the external world. We could say that a skin has been formed which has been made so supple by the excitations it constantly receives that it has acquired properties making it uniquely suited to receive these new excitations, retaining only a direct and changeable image of objects completely distinct from the lasting or even changeless trace in the unconscious system. Freud is far from accepting this topical hypothesis without reservations, the fact is that we find all the elements of this hypothesis in Nietzsche. Nietzsche distinguishes two systems within the reactive apparatus, the conscious and the unconscious. The reactive unconscious is defined by memnomic traces by lasting imprints. It is a digestive, vegetative, and ruminative system which expresses the purely passive impossibility of escaping from the impression once it is received. Of course, even in this endless digestion, Reactive forces have a job to do, attaching themselves to the indelible imprint, inventing, investing the trace. But the inadequacy of this first type of reactive force is obvious. Adaptation would never be possible if the reactive apparatus did not have another system of forces at its disposal.
another system is necessary. A system in which reaction is not a reaction in to, to traces, but becomes a reaction to present excitation or the direct image of the object. This second kind of reactive forces is inseparable from consciousness, that constantly renewed skin surrounding an ever fresh receptivity, a milieu where there is always room for new things. It will be remembered that Nietzsche wished to remind consciousness of its need for modesty. Its origin, nature, and function are wholly reactive. But consciousness can nevertheless claim a relative nobility. The second kind of reactive forces show us in what form and under what conditions reaction can be acted. When reactive forces take conscious excitation as their object, and then the corresponding reaction itself is acted. But the two systems or the two kinds of reactive forces must still be separated. The traces must not invade consciousness. A specific active force must be given the job of supporting consciousness and renewing its freshness, fluidity, and mobile, agile chemistry at every moment. This active, superconscious faculty is the faculty of forgetting. Psychology's mistake was to treat forgetting as a negative determination, not to discover its active and positive character. Nietzsche defines the faculty of forgetting as no mere vis interatiae, as the superficial imagine it, it is rather an active and in the stricted sense, strictest sense positive faculty of repression, an apparatus of absorption, a plastic, regenerative, and curative force. Thus here are two simultaneous processes. Reaction becomes something active because it takes conscious excitation as its object, and reaction to traces remains in the unconscious imperceptible. What we experience and absorb enters our consciousness as little while we are digesting it, as does the thousandfold process involved in the physical nourishment, so that it will be immediately obvious how there could be no happiness, no cheerfulness, no hope, no pride, no present without forgetfulness. But this faculty is in a very special situation. Although it is an active force, it is delegated by activity to work with reactive forces. It serves as guard or supervisor, preventing the two systems of the reactive apparatus from becoming confused. Although it is an active force, its only activity is functional. It comes from activity, but is abstracted from it. And in order to renew consciousness, it constantly has to borrow energy of the second kind of reactive forces, making this energy its own in order to give it to consciousness. This is why it is more prone than any other active force to variations, failures, and functional disturbances. The man in whom this apparatus of repression is damaged and ceases to function properly may be compared, and more than merely compared, with a dyspeptic. He cannot have done with anything. Let us suppose that there is a lapse in the faculty of forgetting. It is as if the wax of consciousness were hardened. Excitation tends to get confused with its trace in the unconscious, and conversely, reaction to traces rises into consciousness and overruns it. Thus, at the same time as reaction to traces becomes perceptible, reaction ceases to be active. The consequences of this are immense. No longer being able to act a reaction, active forces are deprived of the material conditions of their functioning. They no longer have the opportunity to do their job. They are separated from what they can do. We can thus finally see in what way reactive forces prevail over active forces when the trace takes the place of the excitations in the reactive apparatus. Reaction itself takes the place of action. Reaction prevails over action. Now it is striking that when victory is won in this way, the real struggles are only between reactive forces. Reactive forces do not triumph by forming a force greater than that of active forces. Even the functional decay of the faculty of forgetting derives from the fact that it no longer finds in one kind of reactive forces the energy necessary to repress the other kind and to renew consciousness. Everything takes place between reactive forces. Some prevent others from being active. Some destroy others. This is a strange subterranean struggle which takes place entirely in the reactive apparatus, but which nevertheless has consequences for the whole of activity. We rediscover definition of resentiment. Resentiment is a reaction which simultaneously becomes perceptible and ceases to be active. 
a formula which defines sickness in general. Nietzsche is not simply saying that resentiment is a sickness, but rather that sickness as such is a form of resentiment. <clears throat> 3. Typology of resentiment. The first aspect of resentiment is therefore topological. There is a topology of reactive forces. It is their change of place, their displacement, which constitutes resentiment. The man of resentiment is characterized by the invasion of consciousness by mnemonic traces, the ascent of memory into consciousness itself. Of course, this is not all. There is to say about memory. We will have to ask how consciousness is capable of constructing a memory suitable for itself, an acted and almost active memory that no longer rests on traces. In Nietzsche, as in Freud, the theory of the memory becomes a theory of two memories. But insofar as we remain at the level of the first memory, we remain within the limits of the pure principle of resentiment. The man of resentiment is like a dog a kind of dog which only reacts to traces, a bloodhound. He only invests traces. For him, excitation is locally confused with the trace. The man of resentiment can no longer act his reaction, but this topological definition must introduce us to a typology of resentiment. For when reactive forces prevail over active forces in this way, they themselves form a type. We can see that the principal symptom of this type is a prodigious memory. Nietzsche stresses this incapacity to forget anything, this faculty of forgetting nothing and its profoundly reactive nature, which must be considered from all points of view. A type is a reality which is simultaneously biological, psychical, and historical, social, and political. Why is resentiment the spirit of revenge? It might be thought that the man of resentiment comes into being by accident. Having experienced too strong an excitation, a pain, he would have had to abandon the attempt to react, not being strong enough to form a riposte. He would therefore experience a desire for revenge, and by a process of generalization would want to take this out on the whole world. Such an interpretation is mistaken. It only takes quantities into account. The quantity of excitation received, objectively, compared to the quantity of force of a receptive subject. But for Nietzsche, what counts is not the quantity of force considered abstractly, but a determinate relation in the subject itself between the different forces which it is made up. This is what he means by a type. Whatever the force of the excitation which is received, whatever the total force of the subject itself, the man of resentiment only uses the latter to invest the trace of the former, so that is, he is incapable of acting and even reacting to the excitation. There is therefore no need to, for him to have experienced an excessive excitation. This may happen, but it is not necessary. He does not need to generalize in order to see the whole world as the object of his resentiment. As a result of his type, the man of resentiment does not react. His reaction is endless. It is felt instead of being active. This reaction therefore blames its object, whatever it is, an object on which revenge must be taken, which must be made to pay for this indefinite delay. Excitation can be beautiful and good, and the man of resentment can experience it as such. It can be less than the forces of the man of resentment, and he can possess an abstract quantity of force as great as that of anyone else. He will nonetheless feel the corresponding object as a personal offense and affront because he makes the object responsible for his own powerlessness to invest anything but the trace, a qualitative or typical powerlessness. The man of resentiment experiences every being and object as an offense in exact proportion to its effect on him. Beauty and goodness are for him necessarily as outrageous as any pain or misfortune he experiences. One cannot get rid of anything. One cannot get over anything. One cannot repel anything. Everything hurts. Men and things obtrude too closely. Experiences strike one too deeply. Memory becomes a festering wound. The man of resentment in himself is a being full of pain. The sclerosis or hardening of his consciousness. 
the rapidity in which every excitation sets and freezes within him. The weight of the traces that invade him are so many cruel sufferings, and more deeply the memory of traces is full of hatred in itself and by itself. It is venomous and depreciative because it blames the object in order to compensate for its own inability to escape from the traces of the corresponding excitation. This is why resentiment's revenge, even when it is realized, remains spiritual, imaginary, and symbolic in principle. This is the essential link between revenge and memory resembles the Freudian anal sadistic complex. Nietzsche himself represents memory as an unfinished digestion and the type of resentiment as an anal type. This intestinal and venomous memory is what Nietzsche calls the spider, the tarantula, the spirit of revenge. We can see what Nietzsche's intention is. To produce a psychology that is really a typology, to put psychology on the plane of the subject. Even the possibilities of a cure will be subordinated to the transformation of types, reversal and transmutation. <clears throat> Number four, characteristics of resentiment. We must not be deceived by the expression spirit of revenge. Spirit does not make revenge an intention, an unrealized end, but on the contrary gives revenge a means. We have not understood resentiment if we only see it as a desire for revenge, a desire to rebel and triumph. The topological principle of resentiment entails a state of real forces, the state of reactive forces that no longer let themselves act, that evade the action of active forces. It gives revenge a means. A means of reversal, normal, the normal relation of active and reactive forces. This is why resentment itself is always a revolt and always a, the triumph of this revolt. Resentment is the triumph of the weak as weak. The revolt of the slaves and their victory as slaves. It is in their victory that the slaves form a type. The type of the master, the active type, is defined in terms of the faculty of forgetting and the power of acting reactions. The type of slave, the reactive type, is defined by a prodigious memory, by the power of resentiment. Several characteristics which determine the second type follow from this. Inability to admire, respect, or love. The memory of traces itself is full of hatred. Hatred or revenge is hidden even in the most tender and most loving memories. The ruminants of memories disguise this hatred by a subtle operation which consists in reproaching themselves with everything which, in fact, they reproach for the being whose memory they pretend to cherish. For this reason, we must be aware of those who condemn themselves before which is good or beautiful, claiming not to understand, not to be worthy. Their modesty is frightening. What hatred of beauty is hidden in their declarations of inferiority? Hating all that is experienced as lovable or admirable, diminishing by buffoonery or base interpretations, seeing traps to be avoided in all things, always saying, please don't engage me in a battle of wits. What is most striking in the man of resentment is not his nastiness, but his disgusting malevolence, his capacity for disparagement. Nothing can resist it. He does not even respect his friends or even his enemies. He does not even respect misfortune or its causes. Think of the Trojans who in Helen respected and admired the cause of their own misfortune. But the man of resentment must turn misfortune into something mediocre. He must recriminate and distribute blame. Look at his inclination to play down the value of causes, to make misfortune someone's fault by contrast. The aristocrat's respect for causes of misfortune goes together with an ability to take his own misfortunes seriously. The way in which the slave takes his misfortunes seriously shows a difficult digestion and a base way of thinking which is incapable of feeling respect. Passivity in resentiment, happiness, appears essentially as a narcotic drug, rest, peace, Sabbath, slackening of tension and relaxing of limbs, in short, passively. In Nietzsche's passive, does not in Nietzsche passive does not mean non-active non-active means reactive but passive means non-active the only thing that is passive is reaction insofar and it is not active the term passive stands for the triumph of reaction 
The moment when, ceasing to be active, it becomes a resentiment. The man of resentment does not know how and does not want to love, but wants to be loved. He wants to be loved, fed, watered, caressed, and put to sleep. He is the impotent, the dyspeptic, the frigid, the insomniac, the slave. Furthermore, the man of resentment is extremely touchy. Faced with all the activities he cannot undertake, he considers that, at the very least, he ought to be compensated by benefiting from them. He therefore considers it a proof of obvious malice that he is not loved, that he is not fed. The man of resentment is the man of profit and gain. Moreover, resentment could not, be, could not only be imposed on the world through the triumph of the principle of gain, by making profit not only a desire and a way of thinking, but an economic, social, and theological system, a complete system, a di divine mechanism, a failure to recognize profit, this is the theological crime, and the only crime against the spirit. It is in this sense that slaves have a morality, and that this morality is that of utility. We ask, who considers action from the standpoint of its utility or harmfulness, and even who considers action from the standpoint of good and evil, of praiseworthiness and blameworthiness? If we review all the qualities that morality calls praiseworthy or good in themselves, for example, the incredible notion of disinterestedness, we realize that they conceal the demands and recriminations of a passive third party. It is he who claims an interest in actions that he does not perform. He praises the disinterested character of precisely the actions from which he benefits. Morality in itself conceals the utilitarian standpoint, but utilitarianism conceals the standpoint of the passive third party, the triumphant standpoint of a slave who intervenes between masters. The imputation of wrongs, the distribution of responsibilities, perpetual accusation, all this replaces aggression. The aggressive pathos belongs just as necessarily to strength as vengefulness and rancor belongs to weakness. Considering gain as right, considering it a right to profit from actions that he does not perform, the man of resentment breaks out in bitter reproaches as soon as his expectations are disappointed. And how could they not be disappointed, since frustration and revenge are the a prioris of resentiment? It's your fault if no one loves me. It is your fault if I have failed in life, and also your fault if you fail in yours. Your misfortunes and mine are equally your fault. Here we rediscover the dreadful feminine power of resentment. It is not content to denounce crimes and criminals. It wants sinners, people who are responsible. We can guess what the creature of resentment wants. He wants others to be evil. He needs others to be evil in order to be able to consider himself good. You are evil, therefore I am good. This is the slave's fundamental formula. It expresses the main point of resentiment from the typological point of view. It summarizes and brings together all the preceding characteristics. This formula must be compared with that of the master. I am good, therefore you are evil. The difference between the two measures, the revolt of the slave and his triumph, this inversion of the value positing I is of the essence of resentiment. In order to exist, slave morality must always first need a hostile world. The slave needs to set up the other as evil from the outset. Number five, is he good? Is he evil? Here are the two formulas. I am good, therefore you are evil. You are evil, therefore I am good. We can use the method of dramatization. Who utters the first of these formula? Who utters the second? And what does each one want? The same person cannot utter both, because the good of one is precisely the evil of the other. There is no single concept of good. The words good, evil, and even therefore have several senses. We find once again that the method of dramatization, which is essentially pluralist and imminent, governs the inquiry. Nowhere, can the, nowhere else can this investigation find the scientific rule that it constitutes it as a semiology and an axiology, enabling it to determine the sense of value of a word. We ask, who is it that begins by saying, I am good? It is certainly not the one who compares himself to others 
nor the one who compares his actions and his works to superior and transcendent values. Such a one would not begin. But the one who says, I am good, does not wait to be called good. He refers to himself in this way. He names himself and describes himself, thus to the extent that he acts, affirms, and enjoys. Good qualifies activity, affirmation, and the enjoyment which is experienced in their exercise, a certain quality of the soul, some fundamental certainty which a noble soul possesses in regard to itself, something which may not be sought or found, and perhaps may not be lost either. What Nietzsche often calls distinction is the eternal character of what is affirmed. It does not have to be looked for. Of what is put into action, it is not found. Of what is enjoyed, it cannot be lost. He who affirms and acts at the same time is the one who is. The root of the word coined from this, eslos, signifies one who possesses reality, who is actual, who is true. He knows himself to be that which in general first accords honor to things. He creates value. Everything he knows to be part of himself, he honors. Such a morality is self-glorification. In the foreground stands the feeling of plenitude, of power which seeks to overflow, the happiness of high tension, the consciousness of a wealth which would like to give away and bestow. The good themselves, that is to say, the noble, powerful, high-stationed, and high-minded, who felt and established themselves and their actions as good, that is, of the first rank. In the contradiction to all the low, low-minded, common, and plebeian. But no comparison interferes with the principle. It is only a secondary consequence, a negative conclusion that others are evil insofar as they do not affirm, do not act, do not enjoy. Good primarily designates the master. Evil means the consequence and designates the slave. What is evil is negative, passive, bad, unhappy. Nietzsche outlines a commentary on Theogony's admirable poem based entirely on the fundamental lyrical affirmation. We are good, they are evil, bad. We search in vain for the least nuance of morality in this aristocratic appreciation. It is a question of an ethic and a typology, a typology of forces, an ethic of the corresponding way of being. I am good, therefore you are evil. In the mouths of the masters, the word therefore merely introduces a negative conclusion, and this latter is merely advanced as the consequences of a full affirmation. We, the aristocrats, the beautiful, the happy. In the master, everything positive is the premises. He must have premises of action and affirmation, and the enjoyment of these premises in order to conclude with something negative, which is not the main point and has scarcely any importance. It is only an accessory, a complementary nuance. Its only importance is to augment the tenor of the action and the affirmation, to content their alliance, and to redouble the corresponding enjoyment. The good only looks for its antithesis in order to affirm itself with more joy. This is the status of aggression. It is the negative, but the negative and the conclusion of positive premises. The negative as the product of activity, the negative as the consequence of the power of affirming. The master acknowledges it himself in a syllogism where the two positive propositions are necessary to make a negation, the final negation, being only a means of reinforcing the premises. You are evil, therefore I am good. Everything has changed. The negative passes into the premises. The positive is conceived as a conclusion a conclusion from negative premises. The negative contains the essential and the positive only exists through negation. The negative becomes the original idea, the beginning, the act par excellence. The slave must have the premises of reaction and negation, of resentiment and nihilism, in order to obtain an apparently positive conclusion. Even so, it only appears to be positive, this is why Nietzsche insists on distinguishing resentment and aggression. They differ in nature. The man of resentment needs to conceive of a non-ego, then to oppose himself to this non-ego in order to finally posit himself as self. This is the strange syllogism of the slave. 
he needs two negations in order to produce an appearance of affirmation. We already sense the form in which syllogism of the slave has been so successful in philosophy, the dialectic, the dialectic as the ideology of resentment. You are evil, therefore I am good. In this formula, it is the slave who speaks. It cannot be denied that values are still being created, but what bizarre values. They begin by positing the other as evil. He who called himself good is the one who is now called evil. This evil one is the one who acts, who does not hold himself back from acting, who does not therefore consider action from the point of view of the consequences that it will have for third party. And the one who is good is now the one who holds himself back from acting. He is good just because he refers all actions to the standpoint of the one who does not act. To the standpoint of the one who experiences the consequences, or better still, to the more subtle standpoint of a divine third party who scrutinizes the intentions of the one who acts. And he is good who does not outrage, who harms nobody, who does not attack, who does not requite, who leaves revenge to God, who keeps himself hidden, as we do, who avoids evil and desires from <clears throat> desires little from life, like us, the patient, the humble, and the just. This is how good and evil are born. Ethical determination, that of good and bad, gives way to moral judgment. The good of ethics has become the evil of morality. The bad has become the good of morality. Good and evil are not the good and the bad, but on the contrary, the exchange, the inversion, the reversal of their determination. Nietzsche stresses the following point. Beyond good and evil does not mean beyond the good and the bad. On the contrary, good and evil are new values, but how strangely these values are created. They are created by reversing good and bad. They are not created by acting out, but by holding back from acting, not by affirming, but by beginning, beginning with denial. This is why they are called uncreated, divine, and transcendent, superior to life. But think of what these values hide of their mode of creation. They hide an extraordinary hatred, a hatred for life, a hatred for all that is active and affirmative in life. No moral values would survive for a single instant if they were separated from the premises of which they are the conclusion. And more profoundly, no religious values are separable from this hatred and revenge from which they draw the consequences. The positivity of religion is only apparent. They conclude that the wretched, the poor, the weak, the slaves are the good since the strong are evil and damned. They have invented the good wretch, the good weakling. There is no better revenge against the strong and the happy. What would Christian love be without the Judaic power of resentment which inspires and directs it? Christian love is not the opposite of Judaic resentment, but its consequence, its conclusion, and its crowning glory. Religion conceals the principles from which it is directly descended to a greater or lesser extent and often in periods of crisis it no longer conceals anything at all. The weight of the negative premises, the spirit of revenge, the power of resentment. Number six, the paralogism. You are evil. I am the opposite of what you are. Therefore, I am good. Where does the paralogism lie? Let us suppose that we have a lamb who is a logician. The syllogism of the bleeding lamb is formulated as follows. Birds of prey are evil. That is, the birds of prey are all the evil ones. The evil ones are the birds of prey. But I am the opposite of a bird of prey. Therefore, I am good. It is clear that in the minor premise, the bird of prey is taken for what it is. A force which does not separate itself from its effect or its manifestations. But it is assumed in the major premise that the bird of prey is able to not manifest its force, that it can hold back from its effects and separate itself from what it can do. It is evil because it does not hold itself back. It is therefore assumed that one and the same force is effectively held back in the virtuous lamb 
but given free reign in the evil bird of prey. Since the strong could prevent themselves from acting, the weak could act as if they did not prevent themselves. Here we have the foundation of the paralogism of resentment, the fiction of a force separated from what it can do. It is thanks to this fiction that reactive forces triumph. It is not sufficient for them to hold back from activity. They must also reverse the relation of forces. They must oppose themselves to active forces and represent themselves as superior. The process of accusation in resentment fulfills this task. Reactive forces project an abstract and neutralized image of force. Such a force separated from its effects will be blameworthy if it acts deserving, on the contrary, if it does not. Moreover, it is thought that the more abstract force is needed to hold back than is needed to act. It is all the more important to analyze this fiction in detail, since by means of it, as we shall see, reactive forces acquire a contagious power, while active forces become really reactive. Number one, the moment of causality. Force is split in two. Although force is not separated from its manifestation, the manifestation is turned into an effect which is referred to the force as if it were a distinct and separated cause. The same event is posited first as a cause and then second as its effect. Scientists do not know better. Scientists do know better when they force when they say force moves, force causes, and the like. A simple sign to aid the memory, an abridged formula, is taken to be a cause. When, for example, one says that the light shines, an imaginary relation of causality is substituted for a real relation of significance. Force is first repressed into itself, then its manifestation is made into a different thing which finds its distinct, efficient cause for the force. Number two, moment of substance. Force which has been divided in this way is projected into a substrate, into a subject which is free to manifest it or not. Force is neutralized. It is made the act of a subject which could just as easily not act. Nietzsche constantly exposes the subject as a fiction or a grammatical function. All subjects, the Epicurean's atom, Descartes' substance, or Kant's thing in itself, are the projection of little imaginary incubuses. Number three. Moment of reciprocated determination. The force thus neutralized is moralized. For if it is assumed that a force is not able to manifest the force that it has, it is no more absurd to assume, conversely, that a force could manifest the force that it has not. As soon as forces are projected into a fictitious subject, this subject proves to be blameworthy or deserving. Blameworthy if active force performs the activity, which is its own, deserving if reactive force does not perform the activity which it does not have. Just as if the weakness of the weak, that is to say their essence, their effects, their sole inelocutable, irremovable reality were a voluntary achievement, willed, chosen, a deed, a meritous act. For the concrete distinct distinction between forces, for the original difference between qualified forces, the good and the bad, is substituted the moral opposition between substantialized forces good and evil. <clears throat> Number seven. Number seven, development of resentiment. The analysis has led us from first to a second aspect of resentiment. When Nietzsche speaks of bad conscience, he explicitly distinguishes two aspects. A first in which bad conscience is in a raw state, pure matter, or a question of animal psychology no more. A second without which bad conscience would not be what it is, a moment which takes advantage of this previous content and makes it take form. The distinction corresponds to that between topology and typology. All the indications are that this is also valid for resentiment. Resentiment also has two aspects or moments, the one topological, a question of animal psychology, constitutes resentiment as a raw content. It expresses the way in which reactive forces escape the action of active forces. 
displacement of reactive forces, invasion of consciousness by the memory of traces. The second typological expresses the way in which resentment takes on form. The memory of traces becomes a typical character because it embodies the spirit of revenge and engages in an enterprise of perpetual accusation. Reactive forces are then opposed to active forces and separate them from what they can do. Reversal of the relation of forces, projection of a reactive image. It should be noted that the revolt of reactive forces would still not be a complete triumph without this second aspect of resentment. It should also be noted that in neither of the two cases do reactive forces triumph by forming a greater force than active forces in the first case. Everything takes place between reactive forces, displacement. In the second, reactive forces separate active forces from what they can do, but by means of a fiction, by means of a mystification, reversal by projection. Consequently, two problems remain to be resolved in order for us to understand the whole of resentiment. 1. How do reactive forces produce this fiction? 2. Under what influence do they produce it? That is, what makes the reactive forces move from the first to the second stage? Who elaborates the content of resentiment? Who gives form to resentiment? Who is the artist of resentiment? Forces are inseparable from the differential element from which their quality derives, but reactive forces give an inverted image of this element. The difference between forces seen from the side of reaction becomes the opposition of reactive to active forces. It will therefore be enough for reactive forces to have the opportunity to develop or to project this image in order for the relation of forces and the values that correspond it to be inverted in their return. Turn. They discover this opportunity at the same time as they find the means of escaping from activity. Ceasing to be active, reactive forces project the inverted image. It is this reactive projection that Nietzsche calls a fiction, the fiction of a supersensible world in opposition to this world, the fiction of a god in contradiction to life. Nietzsche distinguishes this projection from the active power of the dream and even from the positive image of the gods who affirm and glorify life, whereas the world of dreams reacts, rea reflects reality, the world of fiction falsifies, depreciates, and denies it. It presides over the whole revolution of resentiment, that is to say, over the operations by which active force is simultaneously separated from what it can do, falsification, accused and treated as blameworthy, depreciation, and the corresponding values are reversed, negation. In and through this fiction, reactive forces represent themselves as superior. To be able to reject all that represents the ascending movement of life, well-constitutedness, power and beauty, self-affirmation on earth, the instinct of resentment here has become genius, had to invent another world from which that life affirmation would appear evil, reprehensible as such. Resentiment still had to become genius. It was still necessary to have an artist in fiction capable of profiting from the opportunity and of directing the projection, conducting the prosecution and carrying out the reversal. We must not think that the transition from one moment of resentiment to the other, however swift and smooth, can be reduced into a simple mechanical sequence. It needs the intervention of an artist of genius. The Nietzschean question which one resounds more loudly than ever. The genealogy of morals contains the first psychology of the priest. The one who gives resentment form, the one who conducts the prosecution and pursues the enterprise of revenge even further, the one who dares to reverse values is the priest, and more especially the Jewish priest, the priest in his Judaic form. It is he the master of dialectics who gives the slave the idea of the reactive syllogism. It is he who forges the negative premises. It is he who conceives of love, a new love that Christians take up as the conclusion, the crowning glory, the venomous flower of an unbelievable hatred. It is he who begins by saying, the wretched alone are the good, the poor, impotent, lowly alone are the good, the suffering, deprived, sick, ugly alone are pious. 
alone are blessed by God. Blessedness is for them alone. And you, the powerful, and the noble, are on the contrary the evil, the cruel, the lustful, the insatiable, the godless to all eternity. And you shall be in all eternity the unblessed, accursed, and damned. Without him, the slave would never have known how to raise himself above the brute state of resentment. Consequently, in order to appreciate correctly the intervention of the priest, we must see in what way he is the accomplice of reactive forces, but only their accomplice and not part of them. He ensures the triumph of reactive forces, that he needs this triumph, but he pursues an aim that is not identical to theirs. His will is will to power. His will to power is nihilism. We rediscover the fundamental position, proposition that nihilism, the power of denial, needs reactive forces, but also its opposite. It is nihilism, the power of denial, that leads reactive forces to triumph. This double game gives the Jewish priest an unequal depth and ambivalence. He took the side of all decadence, instincts not as being dominated by them because he divined them in a power by means which one can prevail against the world. We will have to return to do those famous passages where Nietzsche considers Judaism of the Jewish priest. They have often produced the most dubious interpretations. We know that the Nazis had ambiguous relations with Nietzsche's work, ambiguous because they liked to appeal to it, but could not do so without mutilating quotations, falsifying editions, and banning important texts. On the other hand, Nietzsche himself did not have an ambiguous relations with the Bismarckian regime, still less with pan-Germanism and anti-Semitism. He despised and hated them. Do not associate with anyone who is implicated in this shameless racial hoax. And the crude occur, but finally, what do you think I feel when the name of Zarathustra comes from the mouths of anti-Semites? In order to understand the sense of Nietzschean reflections on Judaism, it must be recalled that the Jewish question had become, in the Hegelian school, a dialectical theme par excellence. Nietzsche takes up the question once again, but according to his own method. He asks, how is the priest constituted in the history of the Jewish people? Under what conditions is he constituted? Conditions which will prove decisive for the whole of European history. Nothing is more striking than Nietzsche's admiration for the kings of Israel and the Old Testament. The Jewish problem is the same as the problem of the constitution of the priest in this world of Israel. This is the true typological problem. This is why Nietzsche is so insistent on the following point. I am the inventor of the psychology of the priest. It is true that there are racial considerations in Nietzsche, but race only ever intervenes as an element in a crossbreeding, as a factor in a complex, which is physiological, but also psychological, political, historical, and social. Such a complex is exactly what Nietzsche calls a type, the type of the priest. There is no other problem for Nietzsche. And this same Jewish people, which at one moment in its history found its conditions of existence in the priest, is today the people to save Europe, to protect it from itself by inventing new conditions. What Nietzsche wrote about Judaism cannot be read without recalling what he wrote to Fritsch, an anti-Semite and racist writer. I beg you to stop sending me your publications, if you please. I fear for my patience. 8. Bad Conscience and Interiority The objective of both forms of resentment is to deprive active forces of its material conditions of operation, to keep it strictly separate from what it can do. But while it is true that active force is fictitiously separated from what it can do, it is also true that something real happens to it as a result of this fiction. In this respect, our question continues to resound. What does active force really become? Nietzsche's answer is extremely precise. Whatever the reason that an active force is falsified, deprived of its conditions of operation, and separated what it can do, separated from what it can do, it is turned back inside, turned back against itself. Being interiorized, being turned back against itself, this is the way in which active force becomes truly reactive. 
All instincts that do not discharge themselves outwardly turn inward. And this is what I call the internalization of man, that is, the origin of bad conscience. It is in this sense that bad conscience takes over the job of resentiment, as it has appeared to us. Resentiment is separ inseparable from a ghastly invitation, from a temptation, and <clears throat> as it has appeared to us, resentiment is inseparable from a ghastly invitation, from a temptation, and from a will to spread an infection. It hides its hatred under a tempting love. I accuse you, it is for your own good. I love you in order that you will join in me. Until you are joined with me, until you yourself become a painful, sick, reactive being, a good being. When would man of resentiment achieve the ultimate, subtlest, sublimest triumph of revenge? Undoubtedly, if they succeed in poisoning the conscientious, the conscientiousness of the fortunate with their own misery, with all misery, so that one day the fortunate begin to be ashamed of their own good fortune, and perhaps said to one another, it is disgraceful to be fortunate. There is too much misery. In resentiment, active, reactive forces accuses and projects itself. But resentiment would be nothing if it did not lead the accused to admit his wrongs, to turn back to himself. The interjection of active forces is not the opposite of projection, but the consequence and continuation of reactive projection. We should not see bad conscience as a new type. <clears throat> At best, we will find the reactive type, the slave type, to be concrete varieties in which resentment is almost the pure state. We will find others where bad conscience, reaching its full development, covers up resentment. Reactive forces continue to pass through the successive stages of their triumph. Bad conscience extends resentment leads us further into a domain where the contagion has spread. Active forces become reactive. The master becomes a slave. Separated from what it can do, active force does not evaporate. Turning back against itself, it produces pain. No longer rejoicing in itself, but producing pain. This uncanny, dreadfully joyous labor of a soul voluntarily at odds with itself that makes itself suffer out of joy in making suffer. While pleasure is felt and sought in ill-constitutedness, decay, pain, mischance, ugliness, voluntary deprivation, self-mortification, self-flagellation, self-sacrifice. <clears throat> Rather than being regulated by reactive forces, pain is produced by the former active force. This results in a curious, unfathomable phenomenon, a multiplication, a self-impregnation, a hyper-production of pain. Bad conscience is the conscience that multiplies its pain, which has found a technique for manufacturing pain by turning active force back against itself, the squalid workshop, the multiplication of pain by the interiorization or interjection of force. This is the first definition of bad conscience. <clears throat> Number nine, the problem of pain. Such, at least, is the definition of the first aspect of bad conscience, of the topological aspect, its raw or material state. Interiority is a complex notion. What is interiorized is primarily active force, but interiorized force becomes manufacturer of pain, and as pain is produced more abundantly, interiority gains, in depth, width, and height, an ever more voracious abyss. This means, secondly, that pain in its turn is interiorized, sensualized, spiritualized. What do these expressions mean? A new sense is invented for pain, an internal sense, an inward sense. Pain is made the consequence of a sin, a fault. You have produced your pain because you have sinned. You will save yourself by manufacturing your pain. Pain conceived as the consequence of of an inward fault and the interior mechanism of salvation, pain being interiorized as fast as it is produced, pain transformed into feelings of guilt, fear, and punishment. This is the second aspect of bad conscience. It is its typological mo moment. Bad conscience as feeling of guilt. 
In order to understand the nature of this invention, we must assess the importance of a more general problem. What is the meaning of pain? The meaning of existence is completely dependent on it. Existence is meaningful only to the extent that the pain of existence has meaning. Now, pain is a reaction. Thus, it appears that its only meaning consists in the possibility of acting this reaction, or at least of localizing it, isolating its traits, in order to avoid all propagation until one can react once more. The active meaning of pain therefore appears as an external meaning. In order for pain to be judged from an active point of view, it must be kept in the element of its exteriority. There is a whole art in this, an art which is that of the only, only the masters. The masters have a secret. They know that pain has only one meaning, giving pleasure to someone. Giving pleasure to someone who inflicts or contemplates pain. If the active man is not able to take his own pain seriously, it is because he always imagines someone to whom it gives pleasure. It is not for nothing that such an imagination is found in the belief of the active gods which peopled the Greek world. Every evil, the sight of which edifies a god, is justified. That was at bottom the ultimate meeting of the Trojan Wars and other such tragic terrors. There can be no doubt whatever. They're, they were intended as festival plays for the gods. There is a tendency to invoke pain as an argument against existence. This way of arguing testifies to a way of thinking which is dear to us, a reactive way. We not only put ourselves in the position of the one who suffers, but in the position of the man of resentment who no longer acts his reactions. It must be understood that the active meaning of pain appears in other perspectives. Pain is not an argument against life, but on the contrary, a stimulant to life, a bait for life, an argument in its favor. Seeing or even inflicting suffering is a structure of life as active life, an active manifestation of life. Pain has an immediate meaning in favor of life, its external meaning. Our delicacy, and even more, our tartrufery, resist a really vivid comprehension of the degree to which cruelty constituted the great festival pleasure of more primitive men, and was indeed an ingredient of almost every one of their pleasures. Without cruelty, there is no festival. Thus, the longest and most ancient part of human history teaches and in punishment, there is so much that is festive. This is Nietzsche's contribution to a peculiarly spiritual problem. What is the meaning of pain and suffering? We must admire the astonishing inventions of the bad conscience still even more. A new meaning for suffering, an internal meaning. It is no longer a question of acting one's pain, nor of judging it from an active standpoint. On the contrary, one is numbed against pain by passion the passion of the most savage. The pain has made the consequence of a fault and the means of a salvation. Pain is healed by manufacturing yet more pain and by internalizing it still further. One tries to forget, that is to say, one cures oneself of pain by infecting the wound. Nietzsche had already pointed out an essential thesis in the birth of tragedy. Tragedy lies at the same time as drama becomes an inward conflict and suffering is internalized. But who invents and wills the internal meaning of pain? 10. Development of bad conscience. The Christian priest. Internalization of force, then, internalization of pain itself. Passage from the first to the second moment of bad conscience is no more axiomatic than the linkage of the two aspects of resentment was. The invention of the priest is again necessary. This second incarnation of the priest the Christian one, it was only in the hands of the priest that the artist in guilt feelings that it achieved form. The Christian priest brings bad conscience out of its raw animal state. He presides over the internalization of pain. The doctor priest heals by infecting the wound. The artist priest raises bad conscience to its superior form, pain, the consequence of a sin. But how does he go about it? If one wanted to express the value of the priestly existence in the briefest formula, it would be the priest alters the direction of resentment. It will be recalled that the man of resentment, who is by nature full of pain, is looking for a cause for his suffering. 
He accuses. He accuses everything that is active in life. The priest appears in an initial form here. He presides over the accusation. He organizes it. Look at these men who call themselves good. I tell you, these are the evil ones. The power of resentment is therefore completely directed towards the other, against others. But resentment is an explosive substance. It makes active forces become reactive. Resentment must then adapt itself to these new conditions. It must change direction. The reactive man must now find the cause of his suffering in himself. His bad conscience suggests to him that he must look for this cause in himself, in some guilt, a piece of the past. He must understand his suffering as a punishment. And the priest appears a second time in order to preside over this change of direction. Quite so, my sheep. Someone must be to blame for it, and you alone are to blame for yourself. The priest invents the notion of sin. Sin has been the greatest event so far in the history of the sick soul. We possess it in the most dangerous and fateful artifice of religious interpretation. The word fault now refers to the fault which I have committed, to my own fault, to my guilt. This is how pain is internalized. The consequence of a sin it has now an only an inward meaning. The relationship between Judaism and Christianity must be evaluated from two standpoints. On the one hand, Christianity is the end result of Judaism. It follows on from it. It completes its project. The whole power of resentment ends with the God of the poor, the sick, and the sinners. In some well-known passages, Nietzsche insists on the spiteful character of St. Paul, on the baseness of the New Testament. Even the death of Christ is a detour which leads back to Judaic values. By means of this death, a pseudo-opposition between love and hate is set up. This love is made more seductive, as if it were independent of this hate. The truth is that Pontius Pilate discovered the remains hidden. Christianity is the consequence of Judaism. All its premises are found there. It is merely the conclusion from these premises. But from another standpoint, Christianity does, not, does sound a new note. It is not content to complete resentment. It changes its direction. It imposes the new invention, bad conscience. But once again, it should not be thought that the new direction of resentment is bad con in bad conscience is opposed to the first direction. Once again, we are merely concerned with an additional temptation, an additional seduction. Resentment said, it is your fault. Bad conscience said, it is my fault. But resentment is really only appeased when its contagion is spread. Its aim is for the whole life to become reactive. For those in good health to become sick, it is not enough for it to accuse. The accused must feel guilty. It is in bad conscience that resentment comes into its own and reaches the summit of its contagious power. By changing direction, it cries, It is my fault! It is my fault! Until the whole world takes up this dreary refrain. Until everything active in life develops this same feeling of guilt. And these are the only preconditions for the priest's power. By nature, the priest is the one who makes himself master of those who suffer. In all this, we discover Nietzsche's ambition. Wherever dialecticians see antithesis or opposition to show that there are finer differences to be discovered, deeper coordinations and correlations to be evaluated, bad conscience instead of the Hegelian unhappy consciousness, which is a mere symptom, the definition of the first aspect of the bad conscience was the multiplication of pain by the internalization of force. The definition of the second aspect is the internalization of pain by the change of direction of resentment. We have stressed the way in which bad conscience takes over the job of resentment. We must also insist on the parallels between bad conscience and resentment. Not only does each of these varieties have two moments, type, topological and typological, but the passage from one moment to the other brings, to, brings in the priest in both cases, and the priest always acts through fiction. We have analyzed the fiction on which the reversal of values and resentment rests, but one problem remains to be resolved. On which, what fiction does the internalization of pain, the change of direction of resentment in bad conscience, rest? This problem is all the more complicated, since according to Nietzsche, 
it brings into play the whole phenomenon called culture. <clears throat> 11. Culture considered from the prehistoric point of view. Culture means training and selection. Nietzsche calls the movement of culture for the morality of customs. This latter is inseparable from iron co collars, from torture, from the atrocious means which are used to train man. But the genealogist's eye distinguishes two elements in this violent training. That which is obeyed in a people, race, or class is always historical, arbitrary, grotesque, stupid, and limited. This usually represents the worst reactive forces, too. But in fact, that something, no matter what, is obeyed appears a principle which goes beyond principles, races, and classes. To obey the law because it is the law. The form of the law means that a certain activity, a certain act of force is exercised on man and is given the task of training him. Even if they are historically inseparable, these two aspects must not be confused. On the one hand, the histo historical pressure of a state, a church, etc., on the individuals that it aims to assimilate. On the other hand, the activity of man as a generic being, the activity of the human species as such. Hence Nietzsche's use of the words primitive, prehistoric. The morality of custom precedes universal history. Culture is genetic activity, the labor performed by man upon himself during the greater part of the existence of the human race, his entire prehistoric labor, notwithstanding the severity, tyranny, stupidity, and idiocy involved in it. Every historical law is arbitrary. But what is not arbitrary, what is prehistoric and generic, is the law of obeying laws. Bergson will rediscover this thesis when he shows in Les Deux Sources that all habits are arbitrary, but the habit of taking on habits is natural. Prehistoric means generic. Culture is man's prehistoric activity. But what does this activity consist in? It is always a matter of giving man habits, making him obey laws, of training him. Training man means forming him in such a way that he can act his reactive forces. The activity of culture is, in principle, exercised on reactive forces. It gives them habits and imposes models on them in order to make them suitable for being acted. Culture as such is exercised in many directions. It even attacks the reactive forces for, of the unconscious and the most subterranean digestive and intestinal forces. The diet and something analogous to what Freud will call the education of the sphincters. But its principal object is to reinforce consciousness. This consciousness which is defined by the fugitive character of excitations, this consciousness which is itself based on the faculty of forgetting, must be given a consistency and a firmness which it does not have on its own. Culture endows consciousness with a new faculty which is apparently opposed to the faculty of forgetting, memory. But the memory of <clears throat> with which we are concerned here is not the memory of traces. This original memory is no longer a function of the past, but a function of the future. It is not the memory of the sensibility, but of the will. It is not the memory of traces, but of words. It is the faculty of promising, commitment to the future, memory of the future itself. Remembering the promise that has been made is not recalling what it was made at a particular past moment, but that one must hold to it at a future moment. This is precisely the selective object of culture, forming a man capable of promising and thus making use of the future, a free and powerful man. Only such a man is active. He acts his reactions. Everything in him is active or active. The faculty of promising is the effect of culture as the activity of man on man. The man who can promise is the product of culture as a species activity. We understand why culture does not, in principle, recoil from any kind of violence. Perhaps, indeed, there was nothing more fearful or uncanny in the whole prehistory of man than mnemotechnics. Man could never do without blood, torture, sacrifices, when he felt the need to create a memory for himself. How many tortures are necessary 
in order to train reactive forces, to constrain them to be active. Before culture reaches its goal, the free, active, and powerful man, culture has always used the following means. It made pain a medium of exchange, a currency, an equivalent, precisely in the exact equivalent of a forgetting, of an injury caused, a promise not kept. Culture, when related to this means, is called justice. The means itself is called punishment. Injury caused equals pain undergone. This is the equation of punishment that determines a relationship of man to man. This relationship between men is determined following the equation as a relationship of a creditor and a debtor. Justice makes man responsible for a debt. The debtor-creditor relationship expresses the activity of culture during the process of training or of formation. Corresponding to prehistoric activity, this relationship itself is the relation of man to man. The most primitive of individuals, preceding even the origins of any social organization, it also serves as a model for the crudest and most primitive social constitutions. Nietzsche sees the archetype of the social organization in credit rather than exchange. The man who pays for the energy injury he causes by his pain. The man held responsible for a debt. The man treated as responsible for his reactive forces. These are the means used by culture to achieve its goal. Nietzsche therefore offers us the following genetic lineage. Culture as prehistoric or generic activity, an enterprise of training and selection. Two, this means used by its activity, the equation of punishment, the relationship of debt, the responsible man. <clears throat> Three, the product of this activity, the active man, free and powerful, the man who can promise. <clears throat> 12. Culture considered from the post-historic point of view. We have posed the problem of bad conscience. The genetic lineage of culture does not seem to get us anywhere nearer a solution. On the contrary, the most obvious conclusion is that neither bad conscience nor resentiment intervene in the process of culture and justice. The bad conscience, this most uncanny and most interesting plant of all our earthly vegetation, did not grow on the, this soil. <clears throat> on the one hand, revenge and resentment are not the origin of justice. Moralists, even socialist ones, make justice derive from a reactive feeling, from deeply felt offense, a spirit of revenge or justiciary reaction. But such a derivation explains nothing. It would have to show how the pain of others can be a satisfaction of revenge, a reparation for revenge. We will never understand the cruel equation, injury caused equals pain undergone, if a third term is not introduced. The pleasure which is felt in inflicting pain or in contemplating it. But this third term, the external meaning of pain, has an origin which is completely different from revenge or reaction. It reflects an active standpoint. Active forces which are given the training of reactive forces as their task and for their pleasure. Justice is the generic activity that trains man's reactive forces, that makes them suitable for being acted, and holds man responsible for this suitability itself. To justice, we can oppose the way in which resentment and then bad conscience are formed by the triumph of reactive forces. Through their unsuitability for being acted, through their hatred for everything that is active, <clears throat> through their resistance, through their fundamental injustice, Thus resentiment, far from being at the origin of justice, is the last fear to be conquered by the spirit of justice. The active, aggressive, arrogant man is still a hundred steps closer to justice than the reactive man. Just as resentiment is not the origin of justice, so bad conscience is not the product of punishment. However, many meanings punishment can have, there is always one meaning, which it does not have. Punishment cannot awaken a feeling of guilt in the culprit. It is precisely among criminals and conflicts that the sting of conscience is extremely rare. Prisons and penitentiaries are not the kind of hotbed in which this species of gnawing worm is likely to flourish. <clears throat> generally, which is, generally speaking, punishment makes men hard and cold. It concentrates. It sharpens the feeling of alienation. It strengthens the power of resistance. 
If it happens that punishment destroys the vital energy and brings about a miserable prostration and self-abasement, such a result is certainly even less pleasant than the usual effects of punishment, characterized by dry and gloomy seriousness. If we consider those millennia before the history of man, we may unhesitatingly assert that it was precisely through punishment that the development of the feeling of guilt was most powerfully hindered at least in the victims upon whom the punitive force was vented. We can oppose point by point the state of culture in which man, at the cost of his pain, feels himself responsible for his reactive forces and the state of bad conscience where man, on the contrary, feels himself to blame for his active forces and experiences them as culpable. However, we consider culture <clears throat> or justice we always see in them the exercise of a formative activity, the opposite of resentment and bad conscience. This impression is further reinforced if we consider the product of cultural activity, the free and active man, the man who can promise. Just as culture is the prehistoric element of man, the product of culture is his post-historic element. If we place ourselves at the end of this tremendous process, where the tree at last brings forth fruit, where society and the morality of customs at last reveal what they have simply been the means to, then we discover the ripest fruit is the sovereign individual, like only to himself, liberated against, liberated again from morality of customs, autonomous and supermoral, for autonomous and moral are mutually exclusive. In short, the man who has his own independent protracted will and the right to make promises. Nietzsche's point is that we must not confuse the product of culture with its means. Man's species activity constitutes him as responsible for his reactive forces, responsibility death. But this responsibility is only a means of training and selection. It progressively measures the suitability of reactive forces for being active. The finished product of species activity is not the responsible man himself or the moral man, but the autonomous and supermoral man. That is to say, the one who actually acts his reactive forces, and in whom all reactive forces are active. He alone is able to promise precisely because he is no longer responsible to any tribunal. The product of the culture is not a man who obeys the law, but the sovereign and legislative individual who defines himself by power over himself, over destiny, over the law, the free, the light, the irresponsible. In Nietzsche, the notion of responsibility even in its higher form, has the limited value of a simple means. The autonomous individual is no longer responsible to justice for his reactive forces. He is the master, the sovereign, the legislature, the legislator, the author, and the actor. He is the one who speaks. He no longer has to answer. The only active sense of responsibility death is its disappearing in the movement by which man is liberated. The creator, the creditor is liberated because he participates in the right of the masters. The debtor liberates himself even at the price of his flesh and his pain. Both of them liberate themselves from the process which trained them. This is the general movement of culture, the means disappearing in the product. Responsibility as responsibility before the law, law as the law of justice, justice as the morality, justice as the means of culture. All this disappears in the product of culture itself. The morality of customs, the spirit of the laws, produces the man emancipated from the law. This is why Nietzsche speaks of a self-destruction of justice. Culture is man's species activity, but since this activity is selective, it produces the individual as its final goal, where species itself is suppressed. Page 138. We have proceeded as if culture goes straight from prehistory to post-history. We have seen it as a species activity, which, through the long labor of prehistory, arrives at the individual as its post-historic product. And indeed, this is its essence, in conformity to the superiority of active forces over reactive forces. But we have neglected an important point, the triumph, in fact, of inferior and reactive forces. We have neglected history. We must say of culture both that it disappeared long ago and that it has not yet begun. Species activity disappears into the night of the past as its product does into the night of the future. 
in history, culture takes on a sense which is very different from its own essence, having been seized by strange forces of a completely different nature. Species activity in history is inseparable from a movement which perverts it and its product. Furthermore, history is this very perversion. It is identical to the degeneration of culture. Instead of species activity, history presents us with races, peoples, classes, churches, and states. Onto species activity are grafted social organizations, associations, communities of a reactive character, parasites which cover it and absorb it, absorb it by means of species activity, the movement of which they falsify. Reactive forces form collectivities, what Nietzsche calls herds. Instead of justice and its process of self-destruction, history presents us with societies which have no wish to perish and which cannot imagine anything superior to their own laws. What state would listen to Zarathustra's advice? Let yourself, therefore, be overthrown of great events. In history, the law becomes confused with the content which determines it. Reactive content, which provides its ballast and prevents it from disappearing, unless this is to benefit the other, even heavier and more stupid contents. Instead of the sovereign individual as the product of culture, history presents us with its own product, the domesticated man in whom it finds the famous meaning of history, the sublime abortion, the gregarious animal, docile, sickly, mediocre being, the European today. History presents all the violence of culture as the legitimate property of peoples, states, and churches, as the manifestation of their force. And in fact, all the procedures of training are employed, but inside out, twisted, inverted. A morality, a church, a state are all still enterprises of selection, theories of hierarchy. The most stupid laws, the most limited communities, still want to train man and make use of his reactive forces. But to make use of them for what? To carry out what training? What selection? Training procedures are used, but in order to turn man into a gregarious, docile, domesticated animal. <clears throat> training procedures are used, but in order to break the strong, to sort out the weak, the suffering, or the slaves. Selection and hierarchy are put the wrong way around. Selection becomes the opposite of what it was from the standpoint of activity. It is now only a means of preserving, organizing, and propagating the reactive life. History thus appears as the act by which reactive forces take possession of culture or divert its course in their favor. The triumph of reactive forces is not an accident in history, but the principle and meaning of universal history. This idea of a historical degeneration of culture occupies a prominent place in Nietzsche's work. It is an argument in Nietzsche's struggle against the philosophy of history and the dialectic. It is the source of Nietzsche's disappointment. Culture begins Greek, but becomes German. From the untimely meditations onwards, Nietzsche tries to explain how and why culture comes to serve reactive forces which pervert it. More profoundly, Zarathustra develops an obscure symbol, the fire dog. The fire dog is the image of species activity. It expresses man's relation to the earth. But in fact, the earth has two sicknesses, man and the fire dog itself. For man is domesticated man. Species activity is deformed, a natural activity which serves reactive forces, which becomes mixed up in the church and state. The church, I answered, the church is a kind of state, and indeed the most mendacious kind. But keep quiet, you hypocrite dog. You surely know your own kind best. Like you, the state is a hypocrite dog. Like you, it speaks to speak with smoke and bellowing, to make believe, like you, that it speaks out of the belly of things. For the state wants you to be absolutely the most important beast on earth. And it is believed to be so, too. Zarathustra appeals to another fire dog. This one really speaks from the heart of the earth. Is this still species activity? But this time the species activity seized in the element of prehistory, to which man corresponds insofar as he is produced in the element of post-history. <clears throat>
This interpretation must be taken into consideration, even if it is insufficient. In the untimely meditations, Nietzsche was already putting his trust into the non-historical and supra-historical element of culture, what he called the Greek sense of culture. In fact, there are a certain number of questions which we cannot yet answer. What is the status of this double element of culture? Is it real? Is it anything but one of Zarathustra's visions? Culture is inseparable from the history of the movement which perverts it and puts it at the service of reactive forces. But culture is also inseparable from history itself. The activity of culture, man's species activity, is this not a simple idea? If man is essentially, that is to say generically, a reactive being, how could he have, or even have had in prehistory, a species activity? How could an active man appear, even in a post-history? If man is essentially reactive, it seems that activity must concern a being different from man. If man, on the contrary, has a species activity, it seems that it can only be deformed in an accidental way. For the moment, we can only list Nietzsche's thesis. Their precise significance must be considered later. Man is essentially reactive. There is nevertheless a species activity of man, but one that is necessarily deformed necessarily missing its goal, leading to the domesticated man. This activity must be taken up on another plane, the plane on which it produces, but produces something other than man. It is, however, already possible to explain why species activity necessarily fails in history and turns to the advantage of its reactive forces. If the schema of untimely meditations is insufficient for Nietzsche's work presents other directions in which a solution can be found. The aim of the activity of culture is to train man, that is to say, to make reactive forces suitable for service, for being active. But throughout the training, the suitability for service remains profoundly ambiguous, for at the same time it allows reactive forces to put themselves at the service of other reactive forces. To give these latter forces an appearance of activity, an appearance of justice, to form with them a fiction that gets the better of active forces. It will be recalled that, in resentiment, certain reactive forces prevent other reactive forces from being active. Bad conscience reaches the same end by almost opposite means. In bad conscience, some reactive forces make use of their suitability for being acted to give other reactive forces an appearance of acting. There is no less fiction in this procedure than in the procedure of resentiment. In this way, associations of reactive forces are formed under the cover of species activity. These associations are grafted onto a species activity and necessarily divert it from its real sense. Training provides reactive forces with a marvelous opportunity to go into partnership to form a collective reaction usurping species activity. 14. Bad conscience, responsibility, guilt. When reactive forces are grafted onto species activity in this way, they break off its lineage. Here again, a projection intervenes. It is debt. It is the debtor-creditor relationship that is projected and that changes its nature in this projection. From the standpoint of species activity, man was held responsible for his reactive forces. His reactive forces themselves were considered responsible to an active tribunal. Now reactive forces take their advantage of their training to form a complex association with other reactive forces. They feel responsible to these forces. These other forces feel themselves to be judges and masters of the former. The association of reactive forces is thus accompanied by a transformation of debt. This becomes a debt towards divinity, towards society, toward the state, toward reactive instances. Everything then takes place between reactive forces. Debt loses the active character by virtue of which it took part in man's liberation. In its new form it is inexhaustible, unpayable. The aim now is to preclude pessimistically once and for all the prospect of a final discharge. The aim now is to make the glance recoil disconsolately from an iron impossibility 
The aim now is to turn back the concepts guilt and duty, back against whom? There can be no doubt that the debtor, first of all, finally turned back against the creditor, too. Examine what Christianity calls a redemption. It is no longer a matter of discharge from debt, but of a deepening of debt. It is no longer a matter of suffering through which debt is paid, but of a suffering through which one is shackled to it, through which one becomes a debtor forever. Suffering now only pays the interest on the debt. Suffering is internalized. Responsibility debt has become responsibility guilt, so that the creditor himself must accept responsibility for the debt, take upon himself the bulk of the debt. This is Christianity's stroke of genius, says Nietzsche. God himself sacrifices himself for the guilt of mankind. God himself makes payment to himself. God is the only being who can redeem man from what has become unredeemable for man himself. We can see a qualitative difference between the two forms of responsibility, responsibility debt and responsibility guilt. One originates in the activity of culture. It is only the instrument of this activity. It develops the external sense of pain. It must disappear in the product in order to give way to a beautiful irresponsibility. In the other, everything is reactive. Its origin is resentiment's accusation. It grafts itself onto culture and diverts it from its initial direction. It entails a necessary change direct of resentment, which no longer looks outside for someone to blame. It perpetuates itself at the same time as it internalizes pain. We said, the priest is the one who internalizes pain by changing the direction of resentment. In this way, he gives bad conscience form. We ask, how can resentiment change the direction while keeping its properties of hate and revenge? The lengthy analysis above gives us the elements of an answer. Under the cover of species activity, and by usurping this activity, reactive forces constitute associations, herds. Certain reactive forces appear to act. Others serve as material. Wherever there are herds, it is the instinct of weakness that organized it. It is in this milieu that bad conscience is formed. Abstracted from species activity, debt is projected into reactive association. Debt becomes the relation of a debtor who will never finish paying to a creditor who will never finish using up the interest on the debt. Debt toward the divinity. The pain of the debtor is internalized. Responsibility for the debt becomes a feeling of guilt. In this way, the priest comes to change the direction of resentiment. We reactive beings do not have to look for the guilty ones outside. We are all guilty towards ourselves, towards the church, towards God. But the priest does not only corrupt the herd, he organizes it, he protects it. He invents the means which enable us to endure multiplied internalized pain. He makes it possible to live with the culpability which he introduces. He makes us participate in an apparent activity, in an apparent injustice, the service of God. He involves us in association. He awakens in us the desire to see the community prosper. Our underlying insolence serves as an antidote to our bad conscience. But above all, resentment, in changing direction, has lost nothing of its sources of satisfaction, of its virulence, or of its hatred of others. It is my fault. This is the cry of love by means of which we, the new sirens, attract others to us and divert them from their path. By changing the direction of resentment, the men of bad conscience have found the best means to satisfy revenge, to spread the contagion. How ready they themselves are at bottom to make one pay. They crave to be hangmen. It will be noted in all this that the form of bad conscience, just like the form of resentment, implies a fiction. Bad conscience rests on the diverting of species activity, on the usurping of this activity, on the projection of death. <clears throat> Page 143. The ascetic ideal and the essence of religion. Nietzsche sometimes writes as if it were possible to distinguish two and even several types of religion. 
In this sense, religion would not have an essential link with resentment or bad conscience. Dionysus is a god. I could hardly doubt that there are numerous varieties of gods. There is no lack of those who seem inseparable from a certain insouance, a certain halcyonism. Light feet are perhaps one of the attributes of divinity. Nietzsche never stops saying that there are active and affirmative gods, active and affirmative religions. Every selection implies a religion. Following his favorite method, Nietzsche recognizes a plurality of sense, senses in religion depending on the many forces which can take possession of it. There is, therefore, a religion of the strong with a profoundly selective, educative sense. Moreover, if we consider Christ as a personal type, distinguishing him from Christianity as a collective type, we must recognize how far he lacked resentment, bad conscience. He defined himself by glad tidings. He presents to us a life which is not that of Christianity, in the same way that Christianity presents us with a religion that is not that of Christ. But all these typological remarks risk hiding the main point from us, not that typology is not the main point, but that the only good typology is one that takes the following principle into account. The higher degree or affinity of forces. In everything, only the higher degrees matter. Religion has as many senses as there are forces capable of taking possession of it. But religion itself is a force with a greater or lesser affinity for the forces that take possession of it and that it takes possession of itself. Insofar as religion is possessed by the forces of a different nature, it does not reach its higher degree. The only one that matters, where it would cease to be a means. On the contrary, when it is conquered by forces of the same nature, or when, growing up, it takes the possession of these forces and shakes off the yoke of those which dominated it in its infancy, it then discovers its own essence in its higher degree. But each time that Nietzsche speaks to us of an active religion, a religion of the strong without resentment or bad conscience, he is talking of a state in which religion finds itself subjugated by forces of an entirely different nature from its own and cannot unmask itself. Religion is a procedure of education in the hands of philosophers, or religion as a procedure of selection and education in the hands of philosophers. Even in the case of Christ, religion as a belief or a faith remains entirely subjugated by the force of a practice which merely gives the feeling of being divine. On the other hand, when religion comes to act sovereignly by itself, when other forces have to borrow a mask to survive, a heavy and terrible price is always paid, even as religion finds its own essence. This is why, according to Nietzsche, religion on the one hand and bad conscience on the other have an essential link. Considered in their raw state for sentiment, and bad conscience represent the reactive forces which seize the elements of religion in order to free them from the yoke under which active forces hold them. In their formal state, resentment and bad conscience represent the reactive forces which religion itself conquers and develops by exercising its new sovereignty. Resentment and bad conscience. These are the higher degrees of religion as such. The inventor of Christianity is not Christ, but St. Paul the man of bad conscience, the man of resentment. The question, which one, applied to Christianity? Religion is not merely a force. Reactive forces would never have triumphed, carrying a religion to its highest degree. If religion, for its part, was not animated by a will, a will which leads reactive forces to triumph. Beyond resentment and bad conscience, Nietzsche deals with the third stage, the ascetic ideal. But the, the ascetic ideal was also there from the start. In its initial sense, the ascetic ideal designates the complex resentment and bad conscience. It crosses the one with the other. It reinforces the one with the other. Secondly, it expresses all the ways in which the sickness of resentment, the suffering of bad conscience becomes livable, or rather, are organized and propagated. The ascetic priest is simultaneously gardener, breeder, shepherd, and doctor. Finally, in its deepest sense, 
the ascetic ideal expresses the will which makes reactive forces triumph. The ascetic ideal expresses a will. We discover the idea of a fundamental complicity, not an identity, but not a complicity between reactive forces and a form of the will to power. Reactive forces would never prevail without a will which develops the projections, which organizes the necessary fictions. The fiction of a world beyond in the ascetic ideal. This is what accompanies the steps of resentment and bad conscience. This is what permits the depreciation of life and all that is active in it. This is what gives the world a value of appearance or of not. The fiction of another world was already present in other fictions as the condition of their possibility. Conversely, the will to nothingness needs reactive forces. It is not just that it only tolerates life in reactive form, but it needs the reactive life as a means of which by which life must contradict itself, deny itself, annihilate itself. What would become of the reactive forces separated from the will to nothingness? But what would the will to nothingness be without reactive forces? Perhaps it would be something completely different from what we see it as. The sense of the ascetic ideal is thus as follows. To express the affinity of reactive forces with nihilism. To express nihilism as the motor of reactive forces. The Triumph of Reactive Forces The Nietzschean typology brings into play a whole psychology of depths or caves. In particular, the mechanism which corresponds to each movement of the triumph of reactive forces form a theory of the unconscious which ought to be compared to the whole Freudianism. We must nevertheless be careful not to give Nietzschean concepts an exclusively psychological significance. It is not just that the type is also a biological, sociological, historical, and political reality, not only that metaphysics and the theory of knowledge themselves belong to typology, but that Nietzsche, through this typology, develops a philosophy which must, in his view, replace the old metaphysics and transcendental critique and give a new foundation to the science of man, genealogical philosophy. That is to say, the philosophy of the will to power. The will to power must not be interpreted psychologically, as if the will to power wanted power because of a motive. Just as genealogy must not be interpreted as a merely philosophical genesis. Welcome back to Nathan Reed's page 147. The Overman against the dialectic. 1. Nihilism. In the word nihilism, nihil does not signify non-being, but primarily a value of nil. Life takes on a value of nil insofar as it is denied and depreciated. Depreciation always presupposes a fiction. It is by means of fiction that one falsifies and depreciates. It is by means of fiction that something is opposed to life. The whole of life then becomes unreal. It is represented as appearance. It takes on a value of nil in its entirety. The idea of another world, of a supersensible world in all its forms, God, essence, the good, truth, the idea of value superior to life, is not one example among many, but the constitutive element of all fiction. Values superior to life are inseparable from their effect, the depreciation of life, the negation of this world. And if they are inseparable from this effect, it is because their principle is a will to deny, to depreciate. We must be careful not to think that higher values form a threshold where the will stops, as if confronted by the divine. We were released from the constraint of willing. It is not the 
it is not the will that denies itself in higher values. It is higher values that are related to a will to deny, to annihilate life. Nothingness of the will. This Schopenhauerian concept is only a symptom. It means primarily a will to annihilation, a will to nothingness. But it is and remains a will. Nihil in nihilism means negation as quality of the will to power. Thus, in its primary and basic sense, nihilism signifies the value of nil taken on by life, the fiction of higher values which give it this value, and the will to nothingness which is expressed in these, in these higher values. Nihilism has a second, more colloquial sense. It no longer signifies a will, but rather a reaction. The supersensible world and higher values are reacted against. Their existence is denied. They are refused all validity. This is no longer the devaluation of life in the name of higher values, but rather the devaluation of higher values themselves. Devaluation no longer signifies life taking on the value of nil, the null value, but the nullity of values, of higher values. The sensational news spreads. There is nothing to be seen behind the curtain. The characteristics which have been assigned to the real being of things are the characteristics of non-being, of nothingness. Thus, the nihilist denies God, the good and even truth, all the forms of the supersensible. Nothing is true. Nothing is good. God is dead. The nothingness of the will is no longer merely the symptom of a will to nothingness, but ultimately a negation of all will, a tedium vitae. There is no longer any human or earthly will. Here is snow. Here life has grown silent. The last crows who cry are audible here. They are called wherefore? In vain. Nada. Here nothing will grow or prosper any longer. This second sense would be familiar, but no less incomprehensible if we did not see how it derives from and presupposes the first. Previously, life was depreciated from the height of higher values. It was denied in the name of these values. Here, on the contrary, only life remains, but it is still a depreciated life, which now continues in a world without values, stripped of meaning and purpose, sliding ever further towards its nothingness. Previously, essence was opposed to appearance. Life was turned into an appearance. Now essence is denied, but appearance is retained. Everything is merely appearance. Life, which is left to us, remains for itself an appearance. The first sense of nihilism found its principle in the will to deny as will to power. The second sense, the pessimism of weakness, finds its principle in the reactive life completely solitary and naked, in reactive forces reduced to themselves. The first sense is a negative nihilism, the second sense a reactive nihilism. 2. The analysis of... not the... 2. Analysis of pity. The fundamental complicity of the will to nothingness and reactive forces is due to the fact that the will to nothingness that it is the will to nothingness that allows reactive forces to triumph. When, under the influence of the will to nothingness, universal life becomes unreal, life as particular life, nothingness, universal life becomes unreal. Life as particular life becomes reactive. Life becomes simultaneously unreal as a whole and reactive in particular. In its enterprise of denying life, the will to nothingness, on the one hand, merely tolerates the reactive life, but on the other hand has no need of it. It tolerates the reactive life as a state of life close to zero. It has need of it as a means by which life is led to deny and contradict itself. In this way, victorious reactive forces have a witness, or worse, a leader. 
But what happens is that the triumphant reactive forces are less and less tolerant of this leader and witness. They want to triumph alone. They no longer want to owe their triumph to anyone else. Perhaps they dread the obscure goal of its own that the will to power attains through their victory. Perhaps they fear that this will to power will turn against them and destroy them in turn. The reactive life breaks its alliance with the negative will. It wants to rule alone. This is why reactive forces project their image. But this time, in order to take the place of the will which leads them, how far will they go along this path? It is better to have no will at all than this overpowerful, overlively will. It is better to have stagnant herds than the shepherd who persists in leading us too far. It is better to have only our strength than a will which we no longer need. How far will reactive forces go? It is better to fade away passively. Reactive nihilism, in a way, prolongs negative nihilism. Triumphant reactive forces take the place of power, of denying which led them to their triumph. But passive nihilism is the final outcome of reactive nihilism, fading away passively rather than being led from outside. This story can also be told in another way. God is dead, but what did he die of? He died of pity, said Nietzsche. This death is sometimes presented as accidental. Old and tired, weary of willing, God one day suffocated through his excessive pity. The old perp... <clears throat> pardon me. <laughs> Not that. This death is sometimes the effect of a criminal act. His pity knew no shame. He crept into my dirtiest corners. This most curious, most over-importunate, over-compassionate God had to die. He always saw me. I desired to take revenge on such a witness, or cease to live myself. The God who saw everything, even man. This God had to die. Man could not endure that such a witness should live. What is pity? It is this intolerance for states of life close to zero. Pity is the love of life, but of the weak, the sick, reactive life. It is militant and announces the final victory of the poor, the suffering, the powerless, and the small. It is divine and gives them this victory. Who feels pity? Precisely those who can tolerate only life when it is reactive. Those who need this life and this triumph. Those who built their temples on the marshy ground of such a life. Those who hate everything which is active in life. Those who use life to deny and depreciate life. To oppose itself. Pity, in Nietzsche's symbolism, always designates this complex of will to nothingness and reactive forces. This affinity or tolerance of one for the other. Pity is practical nihilism. Pity persuades nothingness. One does not say nothingness. One says the beyond, or God, or true life, or nirvana, redemption, blessedness. This innocent rhetoric from the domain of religio-moral idiosyncrasy at once appears much less innocent when one grasps which tendency here is draping the mantle of sublime words about itself, the tendency hostile to life. Pity for the reactive life in the name of higher values, God's pity for reactive man. We can guess what kind of will is hidden in this way of loving life, in this God of mercy, in these higher values. God suffocates from pity. It is as if the reactive life had blocked up his throat. The reactive man puts God to death because he can no longer bear there being a witness. He wants to be alone with his triumph and his strength. He puts himself in God's place. He no longer knows any values which are superior to life, but only a reactive life that is satisfied with itself and claims to secrete its own values. The weapons which God gave him, resentment, even bad conscience, all the forms of his triumph are turned against and opposed to God. Resentiment becomes atheistic, but this atheism is still resentiment, always resentiment, 
always bad conscience. God's murderer is the reactive man, the ugliest man, rumbling with bile and full of secret shame. He reacts against God's pity. There's also good taste in pity that said at last, away with such a God, better no God, better to produce destiny on one's own account, better to be a fool, better to be God oneself. How far will he go along this road? As far as the great disgust, it is better to have no values at all than higher values. It is better to have no will at all, better to have nothingness of will than a will to nothingness. It is better to fade away passively. It is the prophet, prophet of great weariness, who announces the consequences of the death of God. The reactive life left alone with itself, no longer even having the will to disappear, dreaming of a passive extinction. Everything is empty. Everything is past. All our wells have dried up. Even the sea has receded. The earth wants to break open, but the depths will not devour us. Alas, where is there still in a sea which one could drown? Truly, we have grown too weary even to die. The last man is the descendant of God's murderer. It is better to have no will at all, better to have a single herd. Nobody grows rich or poor anymore. Both are too much of a burden. Who still wants to rule? Who still wants to obey? Both are too much of a burden. No herdsman and one herd. Everyone wants the same thing. Everyone is the same. Told in this way, the story still leads to the same conclusion. Negative nihilism is replaced by reactive nihilism. Reactive nihilism ends in passive nihilism. From God to God's murderer, from God's murderer to the last man. But this outcome is known to the prophet. There are many avatars, many variations on the nihilist theme. Before we reach this point, the reactive life strives for a long time to secrete its own values. The reactive man takes the place of God. Adaptation, evolution, progress, happiness for all, and the good of the community. The God man, the moral man, the truthful man, and the social man. These are the new values that are recommended in place of higher values. These are the new characters proposed in the place of God. The last man would still say, we have invented happiness. Why would man have killed God if not to take his still warm seat? Heidegger remarks, commenting on Nietzsche, if God has disappeared from his authoritative position in the suprasensory super world, then this authoritative place itself is still always preserved, even though it's that which has become empty. The now empty, authoritative realm of the suprasensory and the ideal world can still be adhered to. What is more, the empty place demands to be occupied anew, and to have the god now vanished from it replaced with something else. Moreover, it is always the same type of life which benefits from the depreciation of the whole life in the first place. The type of life which took advantage of the will to nothingness in order to obtain its victory. The type of life which has triumphed in the temples of God, in the shadow of higher values. Then, secondly, the type of life which puts itself in God's place, which turns against the principle of its own triumph and no longer recognizes values other than its own. Finally, the exhausted life which prefers to not will, to fade away passively rather than being animated by a will which goes beyond it. This is still and always remains the same type of life, life depreciated, reduced to its reactive form. Values can change, be renewed, or even disappear. What does not change and does not disappear is the nihilistic perspective which governs this history from beginning to end, and from which all these values, as well as their absence, arise. This is why Nietzsche can think that nihilism is not an event in history, but the motor of history of man as a universal history. Negative, reactive, and passive, nihilism for Nietzsche 
one and the same history is marked out by Judaism, Christianity, the Reformation, free thought, democratic and socialist ideology, etc., up until the last man. Number three, God is dead. Speculative propositions bring the idea of God into play from the point of view of its form. God does or does not exist insofar as the idea of him does or does not imply a contradiction. But the phrase God is dead is completely different. It makes the existence of God depend on a synthesis. It synthesizes the idea of God with time, becoming history and man. It says at one and the same time, God existed, and he is dead, and he will rise from the dead. God has become man, and man has become God. The phrase God is dead is not a speculative proposition, but a dramatic proposition, the dramatic proposition par excellence. God cannot be made the object of synthetic knowledge without death entering into him. Existence or non-existence cease to be absolute determinations, which derive from the idea of God, but rather life and death become relative determinations which correspond to the forces entering into synthesis with or in the idea of God. The dramatic proposition is synthetic, therefore essentially pluralist, typological and differential. Who dies and who puts God to death? When gods die, they always die many kinds of deaths. From the point of view of negative nihilism, the moment of the Judaic and Christian consciousness, the idea of God expresses the will to nothingness, the depreciation of life. If one shifts the center of gravity of life, out of life, into the beyond, into nothingness, one has deprived life as such of its center of gravity. But depreciation, hatred of life in general, entails a glorification of the reactive life in particular. They, the evil ones, the sinners, we, the good. Principles and consequence. The Judaic consciousness of the consciousness of, is the, the Judaic consciousness of the consciousness of resentment after the golden age of the kings of Israel presents these two aspects. The universal appears as a hatred for life, the particular as a love of life provided that it is sick and reactive. But for these two aspects to be related as premises and conclusion, as principle and consequence, for love to be the consequence of hate, it is of the greatest importance that it be hidden. The will to nothingness must be made more seductive by opposing one aspect to the other, by making love an antithesis of hate. The Jewish God puts his son to death by making the Jewish God puts his son to death to make him independent of himself and of the Jewish people. This is the first sense of the death of God. Even Saturn did not have this subtlety of motive. The Judaic consciousness puts God to death in the person of the son. It invents a God of love who would prefer to suffer from hate rather than find his premises and principle there. The Judaic consciousness makes God in his Son independent of Jewish principles themselves. In putting God to death, it has found the way of making its God a God who is universal for all, and truly cosmopolitan. The Christian God is therefore the Jewish God, but the Jewish God becomes cosmopolitan, a conclusion separated from its premises. On the cross, God ceases to appear as a Jew. Moreover, on the cross, it is the old God who dies and the new God who is born. He is born an orphan and creates a father for himself in his own image, God of love. But this love is still that of the reactive life. This is the second sense of the death of God. The father dies, the son creates another God for us. The son asks only that we believe in him, that we love him as he loves us that we become reactive in order to avoid hate. Instead of a father who makes us afraid, we have a, we have a son who asks for a little confidence, a little belief. Apparently detached from its hateful premises, the love of the reactive life must be valid in itself 
and must become the universal for the Christian consciousness. Third sense of the death of God, St. Paul seizes hold of this death. He gives it an interpretation which constitutes Christianity as such. The Gospels had begun, and St. Paul brought to perfection a grandiose falsification in the first place. Christ is said to have died for our sins. The creditor is said to have given his own son, to have repaid himself with his own son. So immense was the debtor's debt. The father no longer kills his own son to make him independent, but for us, because of us. First element of the interpretation of St. Paul. God put his son on the cross out of love. We respond to this love to the extent that we feel guilty, guilty of this debt and we redress it by accusing ourselves, by paying interest on the debt. Through the love of God, through the sacrifice of his Son, the whole life becomes reactive. Life dies, but it is reborn as reactive. The reactive life is the content of survival as such, the content of the resurrection. The reactive life alone is God's elect. The reactive life alone finds grace before God, before the willingness to nothingness. The crucified God rises from the dead. This is St. Paul's other falsification, the resurrection of Christ and the afterlife for us, the unity of love and the reactive life. It is no longer the Father who kills the Son. It is no longer the Son who kills the Father. The Father dies in the Son. The Son is resurrected in the Father, for us because of us. In fact, St. Paul could make no use at all of the Redeemer's life. He needed the death on the cross and something in addition, the resurrection. Resentiment is not only hidden in the Christian consciousness, its direction has changed. The Judaic consciousness was consciousness of resentiment. The Christian consciousness is bad conscience. Christian consciousness is the Judaic consciousness reversed, turned around. The love of life, but as reactive life, became the universal. Love became the principle. Undying hatred appears merely as a consequence of this love, the means to be used against anyone who resists this love. Warrior Jesus, hateful Jesus, but for the sake of love. From the point of view of reactive nihilism, the moment of European consciousness. Up to this point, the death of God has meant the synthesis of the will to nothingness and the reactive life in the idea of God. These elements can be synthesized in many different proportions, but insofar as the reactive life becomes what is essential, Christianity has a strange result. It teaches us that we put God to death. In this way, it secretes its own atheism, an atheism of bad conscience and resentment. The reactive life, instead of the divine will, divine will the reactive man instead of God, the man-God replacing the God-man. The European man. Man killed God, but which man killed God? The reactive man, the ugliest of men. The divine will, the will to nothingness, cannot tolerate any other life but the reactive one, and this no longer even tolerates God. It cannot bear God's pity. It takes his sacrifice literally. It suffocates him in the trap of his mercy. It prevents him from rising from the dead. It sits on the coffin lid. We no longer have the correlation of divine will and reactive life, but rather the displacement of God by reactive man. This is the fourth sense of the death of God. God suffocates through love of the reactive life. God is suffocated by the ungrateful one whom he loves too much. 3. From the point of view of passive nihilism, the moment of Buddhist consciousness, if the falsifications which begin with the Gospels and which find their definitive form in St. Paul are taken into account, what is left of Christ? What is his personal type? What is the sense of his death? What Nietzsche calls the gaping contradiction of the Gospel must guide us. What these texts allow us to guess of the true Christ is as follows. The glad tidings that he bears, the suppression of the idea of sin, the absence of all resentment and of all spirit of revenge, the consequent refusal of all war, the revelation of the kingdom of God on earth as state of the heart, and above all, the acceptance of death 
as proof of his doctrine. It is easy to see what Nietzsche is getting at. Christ was the opposite of what St. Paul made of him. The true Christ was a kind of Buddha, a Buddha on a soil very little like that of India. Given his surroundings, he was too far ahead of his time. He had already taught the reactive life to, divide, to die serenely, to fade away passively. He showed the reactive life its true outcome when it was still struggling with the will to power. He gave the reactive life a certain hedonism, the last man a certain nobility. When men were still at the stage of wondering whether they could take God's place, he gave passive nihilism a certain nobility where men were still at the stage of negative nihilism, when reactive nihilism had hardly begun. Beyond bad conscience and resentment, Jesus gave the reactive man a lesson. He taught him to die. He was the gentlest of the decadents, but the most interesting. Christ was neither a Jew nor Christian, but Buddhist, nearer the Dalai Lama than the Pope, so far ahead of his country, of his surroundings, that his death had to be deformed, his whole story falsified, moved backwards, made to serve preceding stages, turned to the benefit of ne negative or reactive nihilism, reversed by Paul into pagan mystery doctrine, which finally learns to treat with the entire state organization and wages war, condemns, tortures, swears, hates. Hate became the instrument of this very gentle Christ, for here we have the difference between Buddhism and the official Christianity of St. Paul. Buddhism is the religion of passive nihilism. Buddhism is a religion for the end of for the end and fatigue of a civilization. Christianity does not even find civilization in existence. It establishes civilization if need be. It is characteristic of Christian and European history to achieve by iron and fire, an end which elsewhere is already given and naturally attained, the final outcome of nihilism. What Buddhism had come to live as a realized end, as an attained perfection, Christianity saw only as a motor. There is nothing to prevent it from reaching this end. There is nothing to prevent the outcome of Christianity being a practice, freed from the whole Pauline mythology. There is nothing to prevent it from rediscovering the true practice of Christ. Buddhism is progressing silently in the whole of Europe. But how much hate and how many wars would be needed to get to this point? Christ was personally established at this ultimate end. He had attained it with a beat of his wings, bird of the Buddha, in surroundings which were not Buddhist. Christianity, on the other hand, has to go through all the stages of nihilism to make this end its own the result of a long and terrible politics of revenge. Page, 150, page 156, number 4, Against Hegelianism. We must not see this philosophy of history and religion as a revival or even a caricature of Hegel's views. The relationship and the difference are deeper. God is dead. God has become man. Man has become God. Nietzsche, in contrast to his predecessors, does not believe in this death. He does not bet on this cross, that is to say, he does not make this death an event possessing its meaning in itself. The death of God has as many meanings as there are forces capable of seizing Christ and making him die. But we are still waiting for the forces or the power which will carry this death to its highest point and make it into something more than an apparent and abstract death. In opposition to the whole romantic movement and to every dialectic, Nietzsche mistrusts the death of God. With him, the age of naive confidence comes to an end. The age which at some times acclaims the reconciliation of man and God, at others the replacement of God by man. Nietzsche has no faith in great resounding events. An event needs silence and time to discover, finally, the forces which give it an essence. Of course, for Hegel, too, Time is necessary for an event to attain its true essence. But, Hegel, <clears throat> but this time is only necessary for meaning in itself to become for itself. On Hegel's interpretation, the death of Christ stands for superseded opposition. 
the reconciliation of finite and infinite, the unity of God and individual, of changeless and particular. But the Christian consciousness will have to pass through other figures of opposition in order for this unity to become for itself what it already is in itself. The time that Nietzsche speaks of, on the contrary, is necessary for the formation of forces which give the death of God a sense that it did not contain in itself, which give it an essence determined as the magnificent gift of exteriority. In Hegel, the diversity of senses, the choice of essence, and the necessity of time are so many appearances, mere appearances, universal and singular, changeless and particular, infinite and finite. What are these? Nothing but symptoms. What is this particular, this single, this infinite? And what is this universal, this changeless, this infinite? The former is subject, but which subject? Which forces? The latter is predicate, or object, but what will is it, objective? The dialectic does not even skim the surface of interpretation. It never goes beyond the domain of symptoms. It confuses interpretation with the development of the uninterrupted symbol. This is why, in questions of abstract, of change and development, it conceives nothing deeper than an abstract permutation, where the subject becomes predicate and the predicate subject. But the one that is subject and what the predicate is have not changed. They remain as little determined at the end as they were at the beginning as little interpreted as possible. Everything has happened in the intermediate regions. It is not surprising that the dialectic proceeds by opposition, development of the opposition or contradiction, and solution of the contradiction. It is unaware of the real element from which the forces, their qualities, and their relations derive. It only knows the inverted image of this element, which is reflected in abstractly considered symptoms. Opposition can be the law of the relation between abstract products, but difference is the only principle of genesis or production, a principle which itself produces opposition as mere appearance. Dialectic thrives on oppositions because it is unaware of far more subtle and subterranean differential mechanisms, topological displacements, typological variations. This can be seen clearly in one of Nietzsche's favorite examples, his whole theory of bad conscience must be seen as a reinterpretation of the Hegelian unhappy consciousness. This apparently torn consciousness finds its meaning in the differential relations of forces which are hidden beneath sham oppositions. In the same way, the relationship of Christianity with Judaism only lets opposition continue to exist as a cover and a pretext. Deprived of all its ambitions, opposition ceases to be formative impelling and coordinating. It becomes a symptom, nothing but a symptom to be interpreted. Deprived of its claim to give an account of difference, contradiction appears for what it is, a perpetual misinterpretation of difference itself, a confused inversion of genealogy. In fact, to the eye of the genealogist, the labor of the negative is only a coarse approximation to the games of the will to power. Considering symptoms abstractly, making the movement of appearance into the genetic law of things, and retaining only inverted image of principle. The whole dialectic operates and moves in the element of fiction. How could its solution not be fictitious when its problems themselves are? There is no fiction that it does not turn into a moment of spirit, one of its own moments. One dialectician cannot accuse another of standing on his head. It is the fundamental character of the dialectic itself. How could it still maintain a critical viewpoint in this position? Nietzsche's work is directed against the dialectic for three reasons. It misinterprets sense because it does not know the nature of the forces which concretely appropriate phenomena. It misinterprets the essence because it does not know the real element from which forces their qualities, and their relations derive. It misinterprets change and the transformation because it is content to work with permutations of abstract and unreal terms. 
All these deficiencies have a single origin, ignorance of the question, which one? There is always the same Socratic contempt for the sophist's art. We are informed in the Hegelian manner that man and God, religion and philosophy are reconciled. We are informed in the matter of manner of Feuerbach that man takes God's place, that he recuperates the divine as his own property or essence, and that theology becomes anthropology. But who is man and what is God? Which is particular and what is universal? Feuerbach says the man <clears throat> pardon me. Feuerbach says that man has changed, that he has become God. God has changed. The essence of God has become the essence of man. But he who is man has not changed. The reactive man, the slave, who does not cease to be slavish by presenting himself as God, always the slave, a machine for manufacturing the divine. What God is has not changed either, always the divine, the supreme being, a machine for manufacturing the slave. What has changed, or rather, what has exchanged its determinations, is the immediate concept, the middle terms which can either be subject or predicate of each other, God or man. God becomes man. Man becomes God. But who is man? He is always the reactive being, the representative, the subject of a weak and depreciated life. What is God? He is always the supreme being as the means of depreciating life, object of the will to nothingness, predicate of nihilism. Before and after the death of God, man remains the one that he is, as God remains what he is. Reactive forces and will to nothingness. The dialectic foretells the reconciliation of man and God, but what is this reconciliation if not the old complicity, the old affinity of will to nothingness and reactive life. The dialectic foretells the replacement of God by man. But what is this replacement if not the reactive life in place of the will to nothingness? The reactive life now producing its own values. At this point, it seems that the whole of the dialectic moves within the limits of reactive forces, that it evolves entirely within the nihilistic perspective. There is a standpoint from which the opposition appears as the genetic element of force, the standpoint of reactive forces. From the standpoint of reactive forces, the differential element is inverted, reflected, wrong way up and turned into position. There is a perspective which opposes fiction to the real, which develops fiction as the means by which reactive forces triumph. It is nihilism. The nihilistic perspective, the labor of the negative serves a will. It is sufficient to ask, which will is it? In order to sense the essence of the dialectic, the discovery dear to the dialectic is the unhappy consciousness, the deepening, the re-solution and glorification of the unhappy consciousness and its resources. It is reactive forces that express themselves in opposition the will to nothingness that expresses itself in the labor of the negative. The dialectic is the natural ideology of resentiment and bad conscience. It is thought in the perspective of nihilism and from the standpoint of reactive forces. It is a fundamentally Christian way of thinking, from one end to the other, powerless to create new ways of thinking and feeling. The death of God is a grand, noisy, dialectical event, but an event which happens in the din of reactive forces and the fumes of nihilism. Number five, the avatars of the dialectic. In the history of the dialectic, Stirner has a place apart, the final extreme place. Stirner was the audacious dialectician who tried to reconcile the dialectic with the art of the sophists. He was able to rediscover the path of the question, which one? He knew how to make it the essential question against Hegel, Bauer, and Feuerbach simultaneously. The conceptual question, what is man, has then changed into the personal question, who is man? With what 
the concept was sought for in order to realize it, with who, it is no longer any question at all, but the answer is personally on hand at once, in the asker. In other words, the posing of the question, who, is sufficient to lead the dialectic to its true result, saltus mortalis. Feuerbach foretold man in God's place, but I am no longer man or species being. I am no more the essence of man than I am God and the essence of God. Man and God have been exchanged, but the labor of the negative, once released, is here to tell us. It is still not you. I am neither God nor man, neither the supreme essence nor my essence, and therefore it is all one in the main, whether I think of the essence as in me or outside me. Because man represents only another supreme being, nothing, in fact, has taken place but a metamorphosis in the supreme being, and the fear of man is merely an altered form of the fear of God. Nietzsche will say, the ugliest of men, having killed God because he could not bear his pity, is still exposed to the pity of men. The speculative motor of the dialectic is contradiction and its resolution. But its practical motor is alienation and the suppression of alienation, alienation and reappropriation. Here the dialectic reveals its true nature, an art of quibbling beyond all others, an art of disputing properties and changing proprietors, an art of resentiment. Stirner penetrates yet again to the truth of the dialectic in the very title of his great book, The Ego and His Own. He thinks that the Hegelian freedom remains an abstract concept. I have nothing against freedom, but I wish you more than just freedom. You should be disencumbered of what you do not want. You should also possess what you do want. You should not only be a free man, you should also be a proprietor. But who is appropriated or reappropriated? What is the reappropriating instance? Is not Hegel's objective spirit his absolute knowledge? Yet another alienation, a spiritual and defined form of alienation, and cannot the same be said of Bauer's self-consciousness and pure at or absolute human critique, and Feuerbach's species being, man as species, essence and sensuous being? I am nothing of all that. Stirner has no difficulty in showing that idea. Consciousness or species are no less alienations than traditional theology. Relative reappropriations are still absolute alienations. Competing with theology, anthropology makes me the property of man. But the dialectic cannot be halted until I finally become a proprietor, even if it means ending up in nothingness. At the same time as the reappropriating instance diminishes in length, breadth, and depth, the act of reappropriations changes sense being carried out from a narrower and narrower base. In Hegel, it was a matter of reconciliation. The dialectic was quick to be reconciled with religion, church, state, and all the forces which nourished it. We know what the famous Hegelian transformations mean. They do not forget to conserve piously. Transcendence remains transcendent at the heart of the imminent. With Feuerbach, the sense of reappropriating changes. It is less reconciliation that recuperation, human recuperation of transcendent properties. Nothing is conserved, however, except the human as an absolute and divine being. But this conservation, this final alienation, disappears in Stirner. State and religion, but also human essence, are denied in the ego which is not reconciled with anything because it annihilates everything for its own power, for its own dealings, for its own enjoyment. Overcoming alienation thus means pure, cold annihilation, a recovery which lets nothing which it recovers subsist. It is not that ego is all, but the ego destroys all. The ego which annihilates everything is also the ego which is nothing. Only the self-dissolving ego, the never-being ego, the finite ego, is really I. I am owner of my might, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique one, 
the owner himself returns into his creative nothing, of which he is born. Every higher essence above me, be it God, be it man, weakens the feeling of my uniqueness and pales only before the sun of this consciousness. If I found my affair on myself, the unique one, then my concerns rests on its transitory mortal creator, who consumes himself, and I may say, I have founded my affair on nothing. The interest of Stirner's book is threefold, a profound analysis of the insufficiency of reappropriations of his predecessors, the discovery of the essential relation between the dialectic and the theory of the ego, the ego alone being the reappropriating instance, a profound vision of what has outcome of the dialectic was, with the ego, in the ego. History in general, and Hegelianism in particular, found their outcome, but also their most complete dissolution, in a triumphant nihilism. Dialectic loves and controls history, but it has a history itself which it suffers from, and which it does not control. The meaning of history and the dialectic together is not the realization of free reason, freedom, or man as species, but nihilism. Nothing but nihilism. Stirner is the dialectician who reveals nihilism as the truth of the dialectic. It is enough for him to pose the question, which one? The unique ego turns everything but itself into nothingness, and this nothingness is precisely its own nothingness. The ego's own nothingness. Stirner is too much of a dialectician to think in any other terms, but those of property, alienation, and reappropriation. But too exacting not to see where this thought leads, to the ego which is nothing, to nihilism. This is one of the most important senses of Marx's problem in the German ideology. For Marx <clears throat> is a... For Marx, it is a matter of stopping this fatal sliding. He accepts Stirner's discovery that the dialectic is the theory of the ego. On one point, he supports Stirner. Feuerbach's human species is still an alienation. But Stirner's ego is, in turn, an abstraction, a projection of bourgeois egoism. Marx relates his famous doctrine of the conditioned ego, the species and the individual. Species being and the particular, social order and the egoism are reconciled in the ego conditioned by social and historical relations. Is this sufficient? What is the species and which one is the individual? Has the, dialectical, has the dialectic found its point of equilibrium and rest or merely a final avatar, the socialist avatar before the nihilist conclusion? It is difficult, in fact, to stop the dialectic and history on the common slope down which they drag each other. Does Marx do anything else but mark the last stage before the end, the proletarian stage? Number six, Nietzsche and the dialectic. We have every reason to suppose that Nietzsche had a profound knowledge of the Hegelian movement, from Hegel to Stirner himself. The philosophical learning of an author is not assessed by numbers or quote, numbers of quotations, nor by the always fanciful and conjectural checklists of libraries but by the apologetic or polemical directions of his work itself. We will misunderstand the whole of Nietzsche's work if we do not see against whom its principal concepts are directed. Hegelian themes are present in this work as the enemy against which it fights. Nietzsche never stops attacking the theological and Christian character of German philosophy, the Tubingen Seminary the powerlessness of the philosophy to extricate itself from the nihilistic perspective, Hegel's nihilism, <clears throat> Hegel's negative nihilism, Feuerbach's reactive nihilism, Stirner's extreme nihilism, the incapacity of this philosophy to end in anything but the ego, man, or phantasms of the human, the Nietzschean overman against the dialectic. 
the mystifying character of so-called dialectical transformations, transvaluation against reappropriation, and abstract permutations. It is clear that Stirner plays the revelatory role in all of this. It is he who pushes the dialectic to its final consequences, showing what its motor and end result are. But precisely because Stirner thinks like a dialectician, because he does not extricate himself from the categories of property, alienation, and its suppression, he throws himself into the nothingness which he hollows out beneath the steps of the dialectic. He makes use of the question, which one? But only in order to dissolve the dialectic into nothingness of the ego. He is incapable of posing this question in anything but the human perspective, under any conditions but those of nihilism. He cannot let this question develop for itself or pose it in another element which would give it an affirmative response. He lacks a method, a typological method, which would correspond to the question. Nietzsche's positive task is twofold, the overman and transvaluation, not who is man, but who overcomes man. The most cautious peoples ask today, how may man still be preserved? Zarathustra, however, asks, as the soul and first one to do so, how shall man be overcome? The overman lies close to my heart. He is my paramount and sole concern, and not man. Not the nearest, not the nearest, not the poorest, not the most suffering, not the best, of the higher man. The allusion to Stirner is obvious. Overcoming is opposed to preserving, but also to the appropriating and reappropriating. Transvaluing is opposed to current values, but also to dialectical pseudo-transformations. The overman has nothing in common with the species being of the dialecticians, with man as species or with the ego. Neither ego nor man is unique. The dialectical man is the most wretched because he is no longer anything but a man, having annihilated any, everything which was not himself. He is also the best man because he has suppressed alienation, replaced God, and recuperated his properties. We should not think of Nietzsche's overman as simply a raising of the stakes. He differs in nature from man, from the ego. The overman is defined by a new ways of feeling. He is a different subject from man, something other than the human type, a new way of thinking, predicates other than divine ones, predicates other than divine ones, for the divine is still a way of preserving man and of preserving the essential characteristic of God, God as attribute, a new way of evaluating, not a change of values, not an abstract transposition, nor a dialectical reversal, but a change and reversal in the element from which the value of values derives a transvaluation. All Nietzsche's critical intentions come together in the perspective of this positive task. Amalgamation, a procedure dear to the Hegelians, is turned against them. In a single polemic, Nietzsche encompasses Christianity, humanism, egoism, socialism, nihilism, the theories of history and culture, and the dialectic itself. Taken together, all this forms the theory of the higher man, the object of the Nietzschean critique. In the higher man, disparity manifests itself as the disorder and indiscipline of the dialectical moments themselves, and as the amalgam of human and too human ideologies. The cry of the higher man is manifold. It was a strange, protracted, manifold cry. However, and Zarathustra clearly distinguished that it was composed of many voices, although heard from a distance, it might sound like a cry from a single throat, the greeting. But it seems to me you are still ill-adapted for company. You disturb one, another heart, one another's hearts, you criers of distress, when you sit here together. But the unity of the higher man is also a critical unity, made up entirely of bits and pieces that the dialectic has gathered together. Its unity is that of the thread tying them all together, the thread of nihilism and reaction. Number seven, theory of the higher man. 
The Theory of the Higher Man occupies book four of Zarathustra. This book in the, the <clears throat> number seven, Theory of the Higher Man. The Theory of the Higher Man occupies book four of Zarathustra. This book is the essence of the published Zarathustra. The characters which make up the higher man are the prophet, the two kings, the man with the leeches, the sorcerer, the last pope, the ugliest man, the voluntary beggar, and the shadow. Now, through this diversity of characters, we quickly discover what the ambivalence of the higher man consists in, man's reactive being, but also man's species activity. The higher man is the image in which the reactive man represents himself as higher and, better still, defies himself. At the same time, the higher man is the image in which the product of culture or species activity appears. The prophet is the prophet of great weariness, representative of passive nihilism, prophet of the last man. He is looking for a sea to drink, a sea in which to drown himself but every death seems to him still too active. We are too tired to die. He wills death, but as a passive extinction. The sorcerer is the bad conscience, the counterfeiter, the penitent of the spirit, the demon of melancholy, who fabricates his suffering in order to excite pity, in order to spread the contagion. You would deck out even your disease if you showed yourself naked to your physician. The sorcerer fakes pain. He invents a new sense for it. He betrays Dionysus. He seizes hold of Ariadne's song. He, the falsely tragic one, the ugliest of men, represents reactive nihilism. The reactive man has turned his resentment against God. He has put himself into the place of God that he has killed. But he does not stop being reactive, full of bad conscience and resentment. The two kings are customs, the morality of customs and the two ends of this morality, the two extremities of culture. They represent species activity grasped in the prehistoric principle of determination of customs, but also in the post-historic product where customs are suppressed. They lose hope because they witness the triumph of a mob. They see forces being grafted onto the customs themselves, which distort species activity and deform both its principle and its product. The man with leeches represents the product of culture as science. He is the conscientious man of spirit. He wanted certainty and to appropriate science and culture. Better to know nothing than to half know many things. And through this striving for certainty, he learns that science is not even an objective knowledge of the leech and of its primary causes, but only a knowledge of the leech's brain. Knowledge which is no longer knowledge, because it must identify itself with the leech, think like it, and surrender itself to it. Knowledge is life against life, the life which cuts into life, but only the leech cut into life. It alone is knowledge. The importance of the brain in Schopenhauer's theories will also be recalled. The last pope has turned his existence into a long service. He represents the product of culture as religion. He served God until the end and in doing so lost an eye. The lost eye is undoubtedly the eye which saw active affirmative gods. The remaining eye followed the Jewish and Christian God through the whole of his history. He saw nothingness, the whole of negative nihilism, and the replacement of God by man. The old lackey who despairs because he has lost his master. I am without master, and nevertheless I am not free, neither am I merry except in memories. The voluntary beggar has gone through the whole of the human species from rich to poor. He was seeking the kingdom of heaven, happiness on earth as a recompense, but also as the product of the human species and cultural activity. He wanted to know who this kingdom belonged to and what this activity represented, science, morality, or religion, or something else again, poverty or work. But the kingdom of heaven is no more among the poor than among the rich. Everywhere there is the mob, 
mob above, mob below. The voluntary beggar found the kingdom of heaven to be the only recompense and the true product of a species activity, but only among cows, only in the species activity of cows, for cows know how to ruminate, and rumination is the product of culture as culture. The shadow is the wanderer himself, species activity itself, culture and its movement. The meaning of the wanderer and of his shadow is only that the shadow wanders. The wandering shadow is species activity, but only in so far as it loses its product and its principle and hunts for them desperately. The two kings are the guardians of species activity. The man with the leeches is the product of this activity as science. The last pope is the product of this activity as religion. The voluntary beggar, beyond science and religion, wants to know what the adequate product of this activity is. The shadow is the activity itself insofar as it loses its aim and searches for its principle. We have proceeded as if there were two kinds of higher man, but in fact, each character of the higher man has the two aspects in differing proportions, representing both reactive forces and their triumph, species activity, and its product. We must take this double aspect into account in order to understand why Zarathustra treats the higher man in two ways, sometimes as the enemy who will consider any trap, any infamy, in order to divert Zarathustra from his path, and sometimes as a host, almost a companion, who is engaged in an enterprise close to that of Zarathustra himself. Number eight, is man essentially reactive? This ambivalence can only be interpreted correctly if a more general problem is considered. To what extent is man essentially reactive? On the one hand, Nietzsche presents the triumph of reactive forces as something essential to man and history. Resentiment and bad conscience are constitutive of the humanity in man. Nihilism is the a priori concept of universal history. This is why conquering nihilism, liberating thought from bad conscience and resentment, means the overcoming and destruction of even the best men. More and more better and better men of your kind must perish. Nietzsche's critique is not directed against an accidental property of man, but against his very essence. It is in his essence that man is called the skin disease of the earth. Yet, on the other hand, Nietzsche speaks of the masters as a type of human being that the slave has merely conquered, of culture as a human species activity that reactive forces have simply diverted from its course, of the free and sovereign individual as the human product of this activity, and that the reactive man has only deformed. Even the history of man seems to include active periods. Zarathustra sometimes evokes his true men and announces that his reign is also the reign of man. At a deeper level than forces of their or their qualities, there are modes of becoming of forces or qualities of the will to power. To the question, is man essentially reactive? We must reply that what constitutes man is still deeper. What constitutes man and his world is not only a particular type of force, but a mode of becoming of forces in general, not reactive forces in particular, but the becoming reactive of all forces. Now, such a becoming of forces always requires, as its terminus, a quo, the presence of the opposite quality, which in becoming passes into its opposite. The genealogist is well aware that there is a health which only exists as the presupposition of becoming sick. The active man is that young, strong, handsome man whose face betrays the discreet signs of sickness to which he has not yet succumbed, of a contagion which will only affect him tomorrow. The strong must be defended against the weak, but we know the desperate character of this enterprise. The strong man can oppose the weak, but not his own becoming weak, which is bound to him by a subtle attraction. Each time that Nietzsche speaks of active man, he does so with the sadness of seeing the destiny to which they are predetermined as their essential becoming. The Greek world overthrown by the theoretical man, Rome overthrown by Judea, 
the Renaissance by the Reformation. There is, therefore, a human activity. There are active forces of man. But these particular forces are only the nour nourishment of all forces which defines man and the human world. In this way, Nietzsche reconciles the two aspects of the higher man, his reactive and his active character. At first sight, man's activity appears to be generic. Reactive forces are grafted onto it, perverting it and diverting it from its course. But more deeply, what is truly generic is the becoming reactive of all forces. Activity being the only, activity being the only particular term presupposed by this becoming. Zarathustra never stops telling his visitors, you are failures, you are failed natures. This expression must be taken in the strictest sense. It is not man who does not succeed in being a higher man. It is not man who fails or misses his goal. It is not man's activity which misses or fails to achieve its product. Zarathustra's visitors do not experience themselves as a false higher man. They experience the higher man as that they are as something false. The goal itself is missed, fallen short of, not because of insufficient means, but because of its nature, because of the kind of goal that it is. If it is missed, it is not in so far as it is not reached, but rather in so far as it is reached, it is also missed. The product itself is botched, not because of accidents which happen to it, but because of the activity, the nature of the activity, of which it is the product. Nietzsche wants to say that the man's species activity or culture only exists as the presumed end result of a becoming reactive, which turns the principle of this activity into a failed product. The dialectic is the movement of activity as such, and it, it too is essentially failed and fails essentially. The movement of reappropriations Dialectical activity is nothing more or less than the becoming reactive of man and in man. Consider the way in which the higher men are presented, their despair, their disgust, their cry of distress, and their unhappy consciousness. They all know and feel the abortive character of the goal that they attain, the failed nature of the product that they are. For example, the way in which the two kings suffer from from the transformation of good manners into mob, the shadow has lost its goal, not because it has not reached it, but because the goal which it has reached is itself a lost goal. Species and cultural activity is a false fire dog, not because it is an appearance of activity, but because its only reality is to serve the first term of becoming reactive. It is in this sense that the two aspects of higher man are reconciled. The reactive man is the purified or deified expression of reactive forces, and the active man is the essentially abortive product of an activity which falls short of its goal, essentially. We must reject every interpretation which would have the overman succeed or the higher man fails. The overman is not a man who surpasses himself and succeeds in surpassing himself. The overman and the higher man differ in nature, both in the instances pr which produce them and in the goals that they attain. Zarathustra says, You higher men, do you think I am here to put right what you have done badly? And neither can we follow an interpretation as such that of Heidegger, who turns the overman into the realization and even the determination of human essence. For the human essence does not wait for the overman in order to be determined. It is determined as human all too human. Man's essence is the becoming reactive of forces, this becoming as universal becoming. The essence of man and of the world occupied by man is the becoming reactive of all forces, nihilism and nothing but nihilism, man and his generic activity. These are the two skin diseases of earth. We must now ask why species activity, its aim and its product, are essentially abortive. Why do they only exist as failed? The answer is simple if we remember that this activity aims to train the reactive forces, to make them suitable for being acted, to make them active themselves. How could this project be viable 
without the power of affirming which constitutes becoming active. Reactive forces, for their part, were able to find the ally that led them to victory. Nihilism, the negative, the power of denying, the will to nothingness which forms a universal becoming reactive. Separated from a power of affirming, active forces can, on their side, do nothing except also become reactive or turn against themselves. Their activity, their goal, and their product are abortive for all time. They lack a will which goes beyond them, a quality capable of manifesting and bearing their superiority. Becoming active only exists in and through the will to nothingness. An activity which does not raise itself to the powers of affirming, an activity which trusts only in the labor of the negative, is destined to failure. In its very principle, it turns into the opposite. When Zarathustra considers the higher men as hosts, companions, and forerunners, he thus reveals to us that their project is not without resemblance to his own, becoming active. But we quickly learn that these declarations of Zarathustra must only be taken half seriously. They can be explained by pity. From one end of Book 4 to the other, the higher man does not conceal from Zarathustra the fact that they are laying a trap for him, and they bring him a final temptation. God felt pity for man. This pity was the cause of his death. Pity for the higher man. This is Zarathustra's temptation, which would in turn be the death of him. That is to say, whatever the resemblance between the higher man's project and that of Zarathustra himself, a deeper instance intervenes to make the two enterprises qualitatively distinct. The higher man remains within the abstract element of activity. He never raises himself, even in thought, to the element of affirmation. The higher man claims to reverse values, to convert reaction into action. Zarathustra speaks of something else, transmuting values, converting negation into affirmation. But reaction will never become action without this deeper conversion. Negation must first become a power of affirming, separated from the conditions which would make it viable. The enterprise of the higher man is abortive, not accidentally, but in principle and essence. Instead of forming a becoming active, it nourishes the opposite becoming, becoming reactive. Instead of reversing values, values are changed made to exchange places while retaining the nihilistic perspective from which they derive. Instead of training forces and making them active, they organize associations of reactive forces. Zarathustra says to the higher men, and there is a hidden mob, there is hidden mob in you too. Conversely, the conditions which would make the enterprise of higher man viable are conditions which would change its nature the Dionysian affirmation rather than man's species activity. The element of affirmation is the superhuman element. The element of affirmation is what man lacks, even and above all, the higher man. Nietzsche expresses this lack symbolically as the deficiency at the heart of man in four ways. 1. There are things that the higher man does not know how to do, how to laugh, how to play, to dance. To laugh is to affirm life, even the suffering in life. To play is to affirm chance and the necessity of chance. To dance is to affirm becoming and the being of becoming. Two, the higher men themselves recognize the ass as their superior. They adore him as if he were a god. Through their old ideological way of thinking, they have an inkling of what it is that they themselves lack and what it is, what it is that goes beyond them what the mystery of the ass is, what its bray and its long ears hide. The ass is the animal that says, yeah, the affirmative and affirming animal, the Dionysian animal. Three, the symbolism of the shadow has a related sense. The shadow is the activity of man, but it needs light as a higher instance. Without light, it vanishes. With light, it is transformed and disappears in another way changing in nature when it is midday. One of the two fire dogs is the caricature of the other. One bustles about on the surface in the din and the fumes. It feeds on the surface. It makes the mud boil. That is to say, its activity only serves to nourish, warm up, warm up and maintain a becoming reactive 
a becoming cynical in the universe. But the other fire dog is an affirmative animal, which really speaks from the heart of the earth. Laughter flutters from him like a motley, <clears throat> motley cloud. <clears throat> Number nine, nihilism and the transmutation, the focal point. The kingdom of nihilism is powerful. It is, it, <clears throat> it is expressed in values superior to life, but also in the reactive values which take their place, and again in the world without values of the last man. It is always the element of depreciation that reigns, the negative as will to power, the will as will to nothingness even when reactive forces stand up against the principle of their triumph, even when they end up with the nothingness of the will rather than a will to nothingness. It is always the same element which appears in the principle and which now blends and disguises itself in the consequences or in the effect. No will at all. This remains the final avatar of the will to nothingness. Under the sway of the negative, the whole of life is always depreciated and the reactive life in particular triumphs. Activity can do nothing despite its superiority over reactive forces. Under the sway of the negative, it has no other outlet than to turn against itself. Separated from what it can do, it becomes reactive itself. It now only serves to nourish the becoming reactive of forces. And in fact, the becoming reactive of forces is also the negative as quality of the will to power. We know what transmutation or transvaluation means for Nietzsche. Not a change of values, but a change in the element from which the value of values derives. Appreciation instead of depreciation. Affirmation is will to power, will as affirmative will. As long as we remain in the element, if the negative is no use changing values, or even supporting them, it is no use killing God. The place and the predicate remain. The holy and the divine are preserved, even if the place is left empty and the predicate unattributed. But when the element is changed, then and only then can it be said that all values known or knowable up to the present have been reversed. Nihilism has been defeated. Activity recovers its rights, but only in relation and in affinity with the deeper instance from which these derive. Becoming active appears in the universe, but as identical with affirmation as will to power. The question is, how can nihilism be defeated? How can the element of values itself be changed? How can affirmation be substituted for negation? Perhaps we are closer to a solution than we might think. It will be noted that, for Nietzsche, of all previously analyzed forms of nihilism, even the extreme or passive form constitute an unfinished, incomplete nihilism. Is this not to say conversely that the transmutation which defeats nihilism is itself the only complete and finished form of nihilism? In fact, nihilism is defeated, but defeated by itself. We approach a solution insofar as we understand why transmutation constitutes completed nihilism. We can suggest an initial reason. It is only by changing the element of values that all those values that depend on the old element are destroyed. The critique of the values known up to the present is only a radical and absolute critique, excluding all compromise, if it is carried out in the name of a transmutation and in its terms. Transmutation would therefore be a completed nihilism because it would give the critique of values a completed, totalizing form. But such an interpretation does not yet tell us why transmutation is nihilistic, not merely in its consequences, but in and of itself. The values which depend on this old element of the negative, the values which fall under a radical critique, are all, va all the values known or knowable up to the present. Up to the present means up to the time of transmutation. But what does all knowable values mean? Nihilism is negation as a quality of the will to power, 
Nevertheless, this definition remains insufficient if we do not take up the role and the function of nihilism into account. The will to power appears in man and makes itself known in him as a will to nothingness. And, in point of fact, our knowledge of the will to power will remain limited if we do not grasp its manifestation in resentiment, bad conscience, the ascetic ideal and the nihilism which forces us to know it. The will to power is spirit, but what would we know of spirit without sp the spirit of revenge which reveals strange powers to us? The will to power is body, but what would we know of body without the sickness which makes it known to us? Thus nihilism, the will to nothingness, is not only a will to power, a quality of the will to power, but the ratio cognizendi of the will to power in general. All known and knowable values are, by nature, values which derive from this ratio. If nihilism makes the will to power known to us, then conversely the latter teaches us that it is known to us only in one form, in the form of the negative, which constitutes only one of its aspects, one of its qualities. We think the will to power is a form distinct from which <clears throat> form distinct from that in which we know it. Thus, the thought of the eternal return goes beyond all the laws of our knowledge. This is a distant survival of themes from Kant to Schopenhauer. What we in fact know of the will to power is suffering and torture, but the will to power is still the unknown joy, the unknown happiness, the unknown God. Ariadne sings in her complaint, I bend and twist myself, tormented by all the eternal martyrs, struck by you, the most cruel hunter, you, the God unknown. Speak, finally, you who hide behind the lightning. Unknown, speak. What do you want? Oh, come back, my unknown God, my pain, my last happiness. The other side of the will to power, the unknown side, the other quality of the will to power, the unknown quality, is affirmation. And affirmation, in turn, is not merely a will to power, a quality of the will to power. It is the ratio ascendi of the will to power in general. It is the ratio ascendi of the will to power as a whole, and therefore the ratio which expels the negative from this will. Just as negation was the ratio cognizendi of the whole will to power, thus the ratio which does not fail to eliminate the affirmative form of the knowledge of this will. New values derive from the affirmation, values which were unknown up to the present, that is to say, up to the moment when the legislator takes the place of the scholar. Creation takes the place of knowledge itself, and affirmation takes the place of all negations. Thus we can see that the relation between nihilism and transmutation is deeper than what was initially suggested. Nihilism, expressly the quality of the negative as ratio cognizendi of the will to power, but it cannot be brought to completion without transmuting itself into the opposite quality, into affirmation as ratio ascendi of the same will. A Dionysian transportation of pain transmutation of pain into joy, which Dionysus announces in reply to Ariadne in a suitably mysterious way. Must we not first of all hate ourselves if we have to love ourselves? That is to say, must you not know me as negative if you are going to experience me as affirmative, espouse me as the affirmative, think of me as the affirmative, but why is transmut transmutation nihilism brought to its conclusion? if it is true that it is content to substitute one element for another. A third reason must be taken into account, a reason which risks passing unnoticed. So subtle or scrupulous do Nietzsche's distinctions become. Let us reconsider the history of nihilism and its successive stages, negative, reactive, and passive. Reactive forces owe their triumph to the will to nothingness. Once this triumph is established, they break off their alliance with it. They want to assert their own values on their own account. This is the great resounding event, the reactive man in place of God. We know that the result of we know what the result of this is, the last man, the one who prefers a nothingness of will, who prefers to fade away passively than a will to nothingness. But this result is a result for the reactive man, not for the will to nothingness itself. 
the will to nothingness continues its enterprise, this time in silence beyond the reactive man. Reactive forces break their alliance with the will to nothingness. The will to nothingness in turn breaks its alliance with reactive forces. It inspires in man a new inclination for destroying himself, but destroying himself actively. What Nietzsche calls self-destruction, active destruction, must not, above all, be confused with the passive extinction of the last man. We must not confuse, in Nietzsche's terms, the last man and the man who wants to perish. One is the final product of becoming reactive, the final way in which the reactive man, who is tired of willing, preserves himself. The other is the product of a selection, which undoubtedly passes through the last man, but does not stop there. Zarathustra praises the man of active destruction. He wants to be overcome. He goes beyond the human, already on the path to the overman, crossing the bridge, father and ancestor of the overman. I love him who lives for knowledge and who wishes to know that one day the overman may live, and thus he wills his own downfall. Zarathustra wants to say, I love the one who makes use of nihilism as the ratio cognoscendi of the will to power, but who finds in the will to power a ratio ascendi in which man is overcome and therefore nihilism is defeated. Active destruction means the point, the moment of transmutation in the will to nothingness. Destruction becomes active at the moment when, with the alliance between reactive forces and the will to nothingness broken, the will to nothingness is converted and crosses over to the side of affirmation. It is related to a power of affirming, which destroys the reactive forces themselves. Destruction becomes active to the extent that the negative is transmuted and converted into affirmative power. The eternal joy of becoming, which is vowed in an instant, the joy of annihilation, the affirmation of annihilation and destruction. This is the decisive point of Dionysian philosophy, the point at which negative expresses an affirmation of life destroys reactive forces and restores the rights of activity. The negative becomes the thunderbolt and lightning of a power affirming. Midnight, the supreme focal or transcendent point which is not defined by Nietzsche in terms of an equilibrium or a reconciliation of its opposites, but in terms of a conversion. Conversion of the negative into its opposite. Conversion of the ratio cognizenti into the ratio ascendi of the will to power. We asked, why is transformation the completion of nihilism? It is because in transmutation, we are not concerned with a simple substitution, but with a conversion. Nihilism reaches its completion by passing through the last man, but going beyond him to the man who wants to perish. In the man who wants to perish to be overcome, negation has broken everything which still held it back. It has defeated itself. It has become of affirming a power which is already superhuman, a power which announces and prepares the overman. You could transform yourselves into forefathers and ancestors of the overman, and let this be your final creating. Negation sacrifices all reactive forces, becoming a relentless destruction of everything that was degenerating and parasitical, passing into the service of an excess of life. Only here is it completed. Ten, affirmation and negation. Transmutation or transvaluation means one change of quality in the will to power. Values and their value no longer derive from the negative, but from affirmation as such. In place of a depreciated life, we have life which is affirmed, and the expression in place of is still incorrect. It is the place itself which changes. There is no longer any place for another world. The element of values changes place and nature. The value of values changes its principle, and the whole of evaluation changes character. 2. The transition from the ratio cognizenti to the ratio ascendi in the will to power, the ratio in terms of which the will to power is known, is not the ratio in terms of which it exists. La raison sous laquelle la volonté de la puissance 
est connu et par la raison sous laquelle est est. We will only think the will to power as it is. We will only think it as having being. If we use the ratio for knowing as a quality which passes into its opposite and find in this opposite the ratio for being unknown. 3. Conversion of the element in the will to power. The negative becomes a power of affirming. It is subordinated to affirmation, affirmation and passes into the service of an excess of life. Negation is no longer the form under which life conserves all that is reactive in itself, but is, on the contrary, the act by which it sacrifices all reactive forms. In the man who wants to perish, the man who wants to be overcome, negation changes sense. It becomes a power of affirming, a preliminary condition of the development of the affirmative, a premonitory sign and a zealous servant of affirmation as such. Four. Reign of affirmation in the will to power. Only affirmation subsists as an independent power. The negative shoots out from it like lightning, but also becomes absorbed into it, disappearing into it like a soluble fire. In the man who wants to perish, the negative announces the superhuman, but only affirmation produces what the negative announces. There is no other power but affirmation, no other quality, no other element. The whole of negation is converted in its substance, transmuted in its quality. Nothing remains of its own power or autonomy. This is the conversion of heavy into light, of low into height, of low into high, of pain into joy. This trinity of dance, play, and laughter creates the transubstantiation of nothingness, the transmutation of the negative, and the transvaluation or change of power of negation what Zarathustra calls the communion. 5. Critique of known values. The values known up to the present lose all their value. Negation reappears here, but always in the form of a power of affirming, as the inseparable consequence of affirmation and transmutation. Sovereign affirmation is inseparable from the destruction of all known values. It turns this destruction into a total destruction. 6. Reversal of the relation of forces. Affirmation constitutes becoming active as the universal becoming of forces. Reactive forces are denied. All forces become active. The reversal of values and the establishment of active values are all operations which presuppose the transmutation of values, the conversion of the negative into affirmation. We are now perhaps in a position to understand Nietzsche's texts concerning affirmation, negation, and their relations. In the first place, negation and affirmation are opposed as two qualities of the will to power, two ratios of the will to power. They are both opposites, but also wholes, which exclude their opposite. We can say that negation has dominated our thought, our ways of feeling and evaluating up to the present day. In fact, it is constituted of man, and with man, the whole world sinks and sickens, the whole of life is depreciated. Everything known slides towards its own nothingness. Conversely, affirmation is only manifested above man, outside man, in the overman which it produces, and in the unknown that it brings with it. But the superhuman, the unknown, is also the whole which drives out the negative. The overman as species is, in fact, the superior species of everything that is. Zarathustra says yes and amen in a tre tremendous and unbound way. He is himself the eternal affirmation of all things. I, however, am one who blesses and affirms. If only you are around me, you pure, luminous sky, you abyss of light, then into all abysses, I do carry my consecrating affirmation. While the negative reigns, it is vain to seek a speck of affirmation, either in earth or in the other world. What we call affirmation is a sad, grotesque phantom, shaking the chains of the negative. But at the moment of transmutation, negation is dissipated. Nothing remains of it as independent power, neither as quality nor ratio. Supreme constellation of the being that no wish reaches, that no negation can soil, eternal affirmation of being. 
eternally. I am your affirmation. But why then does Nietzsche present affirmation as an inseparable as inseparable from a preliminary negative condition and also from a proximate, proximate negative consequence. I know the pleasure in destroying to degree that accords with my powers to destroy. 1. There is no affirmation which is not immediately followed by a negation no less tremendous and unbounded than itself. Zarathustra rises to this supreme degree of negation destruction as the active destruction of all known values is the trail of the creator look at the god look at the good and just what do they hate the most the one who breaks their tables of values the destroyer the criminal but it is he the creator two there is no affirmation which is not preceded by an immense negation one of the essential conditions of affirmation is negation and destruction Zarathustra says, I have become the one who blesses and affirms, and I have long struggled for this. The lion becomes a child, but the child's holy yes must be preceded by the lion's holy no. Destruction as the act of destruction of the man who wants to perish and to be overcome announces the creator. Separated from these two negations is nothing, incapable of affirming itself. It might be thought that the ass, the animal that says yea, was the Dionysian par animal par excellence. In fact, this is not the case. Its appearance is Dionysian, but in its reality it is wholly Christian. It is only fit to be used as a god by the higher man. It does represent affirmation as the element which goes beyond the higher man, but it disfigures it in their image and for their needs. It always says yes but does not know how to say no. I honor the obstinate, fastidious tongues and the stomachs that have learned to say I and yes and no, but to chew and digest everything, that is, to have a really swinish nature, always to say yea, only the ass and those like him have learned that. Dionysus once said jokingly to Ariadne that her ears were too small, he means that she does not yet know how to affirm or to develop affirmation. But in reality, Nietzsche himself boasts of having small ears. This is of no small interest to women. It seems to me as though they may feel I understand them better. I am the anti-ass par excellence, and thus a world historical monster. I am, in Greek, and not only in Greek, the Antichrist. Ariadne and Dionysus himself have small ears, small circular ears favoring the eternal return, for long pointed ears are not the best. They are not able to pick up the shrewd word or give it its full echo. Dionysus, you have small ears, you have my ears, put a shrewd word there. The shrewd word is yes, but it is preceded and followed by an echo which is no. The ass's yes is a false yes, a yes which is not able to say no, without echo in the ass's ears. Affirmation separated from the two negations which, would sur which should surround it. The ass can no more articulate affirmation than its ears can pick up it and its echoes. Zarathustra says, my verse is not suited to everyone's ears. I long ago unlearned consideration for long ears. The long ears of the mob. There is no contradiction at this point in Nietzsche's thought. On the one hand, Nietzsche announces the Dionysian affirmation that no negation can defile. On the other hand, he denounces the affirmation of the ass who does not know how to say no. That contains no negation. In the one case, affirmation does not let negation remain as an autonomous power or primary quality. The negative is completely expelled from the constellation of being, from the circle of the eternal return, from the will to power itself, and from the ratio of its being. But in the other case, affirmation would never be real or complete if it were not preceded and followed by the negative. Here we are concerned with negations, but with negations as powers of affirming. Affirmation would never be itself affirmed if negation had not broken its alliance with reactive forces and become an affirmative power in the man who wants to perish.
and if negation had not then been united, totalized all reactive values in order to destroy them from an affirmative perspective. In these two forms, the negative ceases to be a primary quality and an autonomous power. The whole of the negative has become a power of affirming. It is now only the mode of being of affirmation as such. This is why Nietzsche is so insistent on the distinction between resentiment, power of denying, which is expressed by reactive forces, and aggression, the active way of being of a power of affirming. From one end of Zarathustra to the other, Zarathustra himself is followed, imitated, tempted, and compromised by his ape, his buffoon, his dwarf, and his demon. The demon is nihilism because he denies everything, despises everything. He also believes he has taken negation to its extreme degree, but living off negation as an independent power, having no other quality but the negative, he is merely a creature of resentment, hate, and revenge. Zarathustra says to him, I despise your contempt. My contempt and my bird of warning shall ascend from love alone, not from the swamp. This means that it is only as power of affirming, love, that the negative attains its higher degree. The burn of warning which precedes and follows affirmation, insofar as the negative is its own power or quality as it is in the swamp, and is itself a swamp, reactive forces, it is only under the sway of affirmation that the negative is raised to its higher degree at the same time it defeats itself. It is no longer a power and a quality, but the mode of being of the one who is powerful. Then and only then, the negative aggression, negation, becomes active, joyful destruction. We can see what Nietzsche is driving at and what he is opposed to. He is opposed to every form of thought which trusts in the power of the negative. He is opposed to all thought which moves in the element of the negative, which makes use of negation as a motor, a power, and a quality. Just as other ways of thinking are maudlin, such a way of thinking is tearfully destructive, tearfully tragic. It is and remains the thought of resentiment. Two negations are necessary to turn a thought like this into an affirmation, that is to say, an appearance, a phantom of affirmation. Thus resentiment needs its two negative premises in order to conclude with the so-called positivity of its sequel. Either the ascetic ideals need resentiment and bad conscience as two negative premises in order to conclude with the so-called positivity of the divine, or man's species activity need the negative twice in order to conclude with the so-called positivity of reappropriations. In this thought represented by Zarathustra's buffoon repeating everything is false and sad, activity here is only a reaction and affirmation is only a phantom. Zarathustra opposes pure affirmation to the buffoon. Affirmation is necessary and sufficient to create two negations. Two negations form a part of the powers of affirming, which are modes of being of affirmation as such, and in a different way, as we shall see. Two affirmations are necessary to turn the whole of negation into a mode of affirming. The aggression of the Dionysian thinker as against the resentment of the Christian thinker. To the famous positivity of the negative, Nietzsche opposes his own discovery, the negativity of the positive. <clears throat> 11. The Sense of Affirmation According to Nietzsche, affirmation includes two negations, but in exactly the opposite way to the dialectic. One problem remains. Why is it necessary for pure affirmation to contain these two negations? Why is the affirmation of the false affirmation insofar as it does not know how to say so? Let us return to the litany of the ass as sung by the ugliest man. Two elements can be distinguished here. On the one hand, the apprehension of affirmation as what the higher men lack. What hidden wisdom it is that he wears long ears and says only yea and never nay. Your kingdom is beyond good and evil. But on the other hand, a misinterpretation, which the higher men are likely to make, of the nature of affirmation. He bears our burden, 
He has taken upon himself the likeness of a slave. He is patient from the heart, and he never says nay. In this way, the ass is also a camel. At the beginning of the first book, Zarathustra presents the courageous spirit which demands the heaviest burdens with the characteristics of the camel, of the three metamorphoses. The strengths of the ass and those of the camel are very similar. Humility, acceptance of pain, and sickness. Patience towards the chastiser, taste for truth, even if given acorns to eat, and love of the real, even if the real is a desert. Once again, Nietzsche's symbolism must be interpreted and cross-checked with other texts. The ass and the camel do not have the strength to carry the heaviest bur burdens. They have a back for estimating and evaluating their weight. These burdens seem to them to have the weight of the real. The real as such, this is how the ass experiences its load. This is why Nietzsche presents the ass and the camel as impervious to all forms of seduction and temptation. They are only sensitive to what they have on their backs, to what they call real. Thus, we can guess the meaning of the ass affirmation, of the yes which does not know how to say no. This kind of affirma affirmation is nothing but bearing, taking upon oneself, acquiescing in the real as it is, taking reality as it is upon oneself. The idea of the real in itself is an ass's idea. The ass feels the weight of the burdens that it has been loaded with, that it has taken up as the positivity of the real. What happens is this. The spirit of gravity is the spirit of the negative. The combined spirit of gravity is the spirit of the negative. The combined spirit of nihilism and reactive forces. The practiced eye has no trouble in discovering the reactive in all. The Christian virtues of the ass, in all its strengths which are useful for bearing. The prudent eye sees the products of nihilism in all the burdens that it carries. But the ass only ever grasps consequences separated from their premises, products separated from the principle of their production, and forces separated from the spirit which, the anim which animates them. Its burdens, therefore, seem to it to have the positivity of the real, like the strength with which it is endowed, positive qualities which correspond to an acceptance of life and the real. Almost in the cradle are we presented with heavy words and values. This dowry calls itself good and evil, and we bear loyally what we have been given upon hard shoulders over rugged mountains, and when we sweat we are told, yes, life is hard to bear. First of all, the ass is Christ. It is <clears throat> Christ who takes up the heaviest burdens. It is he who bears the fruit of the negative, as if they contained the positive mystery par excellence. Then when man takes the place of God, the ass becomes a free thinker. He appropriates everything that is put on his back. There is no longer any need to load him. He loads himself. He recuperates the state, religion, etc. as his own powers. He has become God. All the old values of the other world now appear to him as forces which control this world and his own forces. The heaviness of the burden becomes confused with the heaviness of his tired muscles. He accepts himself in accepting the real. He accepts the real in accepting himself. With this frightening sense of responsibility, the whole of morality returns at the gallop, but the real and its acceptance remain what they are, false positivity and false affirmation. Faced with the man of the present, Zarathustra says, the unfamiliar things of the future, and whatever frightens stray birds, are truly more familiar and more genial than your reality. For thus you speak. We are complete realists, and without belief or superstition. Thus you thump your chests. Alas, even without having chests. But how should you be able to believe, you motley spotted men, you who are paintings of all that has ever been believed? unworthy of belief. That is what I call you, realists. You are unfruitful. You are half-open doors at which grave diggers wait. And that is your reality. The men of the present still live under an old idea, that everything heavy is real and positive, that everything that carries it is real and affirmative, 
But this reality, which unites the camel and its burden to the point of confusing them into a single marriage, is only the desert. The point of confusing them is a single mirage. The reality of the desert, nihilism. Zarathustra has already said of the camel, as soon as it is laden, it hastens towards the desert. And of the courageous, vigorous, and patient spirit, now life seems to him a desert. Of the spirit of gravity, the real understood as the object, aim, and limit of affirmation. Affirmation understood as acquiescence in or adhesion to the real. This is the meaning of brain, but this affirmation is an affirmation of a consequence, the consequence of eternally negative premises, an answering yes, answering the spirit of gravity and all of its premises, oops, <laughs> and all of its solicitations. The ass does not know how to say no, but first and foremost, he does not know how to say no to nihilism him, itself. He gathers all of its products, he carries them into the desert, and there christens them, the real as such. This is why Nietzsche can denounce the yes of the ass. The ass is not opposed to Zarathustra's ape. He does not develop a power different from the power of denying. He answers faithfully to this power. He does not know how to say no. He always answers yes, but answers yes each time nihilism opens the conversation. In this critique of affirmation as acceptance of responsibility, Nietzsche is not thinking simply nor distantly of Stoic conceptions. The enemy is closer to hand. Nietzsche is engaged in a critique of all conceptions of affirmation, which see it as a simple function, a function of being of or of what is. This applies, however, to this being as con this applies, however, this being is conceived as true or real, whether as noumenon or phenomenon, and however this function is conceived, whether as development, exposition, unveiling, revelation, realization, grasping in consciousness, or knowledge. Philosophy since Hegel appears as a bizarre mixture of ontology and anthropology, metaphysics and humanism, theology and atheism, theology of bad conscience, and atheism of resentiment. For insofar as affirmation is presented as a function of being, man himself appears as the functionary of affirmation. Being is affirmed in man at the same time as man affirms being. Insofar as affirmation is defined by an acceptance, that is to say an acceptance of responsibility, it establishes a supposedly fundamental relation between man and being an athletic and dialectical relation. Once again, and for the last time, there is no difficulty in identifying Nietzsche's enemy. It is the dialectic which confuses affirmation with the truthfulness of truth or the positivity of the real. And this truthfulness, this positivity, are primarily manufactured by the dialectic itself with the products of the negative. The being of Hegelian logic is merely thought being pure and empty, which affirms itself by passing into its own opposite. But this being was never different from its opposite. It never has to pass into what it already was. Hegelian being is pure and simple nothingness, and the becoming that this being forms with nothingness, that is to say with itself, is a perfectly nihilistic becoming, and affirmation passes through negation here, because it is merely the affirmation of the negative and its products. Feuerbach took on the refutation of Hegelian being a long way. For a merely thought truth, he substituted the truth of the sensuous. For abstract being, he, abs he substituted sensuous, determined, real being, the real in its reality, the real as real. He wanted real being to be the object of real being the total reality of being as the object of the real and total being of man. He wanted thought to be affirmative and understood affirmation as the positing of that which is. But the real in itself in Feuerbach preserves all the attributes of nihilism as the predicate of the divine. The real being of man preserves all the reactive properties as the strength and taste for accepting this divine. 
In the men of the present, in the realists, Nietzsche denounces the dialectic and the dialectician, the portrayal of all that has ever been believed. Nietzsche wants to say three things. One, being, the true and the real are the avatars of nihilism, ways of mutilating life, of denying it, of making it reactive by submitting it to the labor of the negative, by loading it with the heaviest burdens. Nietzsche has no more belief in the self-sufficiency of the real than he has in that of the true. He thinks of them as manifestations of a will, a will to depreciate life, to oppose life to life. Two, affirmation conceived of as acceptance, as affirmation of that which is as truthfulness of the true or positivity of the real, is a false affirmation. It is the yes of the ass. The ass does not know how to say no because he says yes to everything which is no. The ass or the camel is the opposite of the lion. In the lion, negation becomes a power of affirming, but in the affirmation remains at the service of the negative, a simple power of denying. Three, this false conception of affirmation is still a way of preserving man. As long as being is a burden, the reactive man is there to carry it. Where could being be better affirmed than in the desert? And where could man be better preserved? The last man lives the longest. Beneath the sun of being, he loses even the taste for dying, disappearing into the desert to dream at length of a passive extinction. Nietzsche's whole philosophy is opposed to the postulates of being, of man and acceptance. Being, we have no other representation of it than the fact of living. How could that which is dead have being? The world is neither true nor real, but living, and the living world is will to power, will to falsehood, which is actualized in many different powers. To actualize the will to falsehood under any power, whatever, to actualize the will to power under any quality whatsoever, is always to evaluate. To live is to evaluate. There is no truth of the world as it is thought, no reality of the sensible world, all evaluation, even and above all the sensible and the real. The will to appearance, to and above, <clears throat> the will to appearance, to illusion, to deception, to becoming and change, to objectify deception, here counts as more profound, primeval, metaphysical than the will to truth to reality, to mere appearance. The last is itself merely a form of the will to illusion. Being truth and reality are themselves only valid as evaluations, that is to say, as lies. But in this capacity, as valid as evaluations, that is to say, as lies, <clears throat> oops, but in this capacity, as means of actualizing, the will through one of its powers they have up to now served the power or quality of the negative. Being, truth, and reality itself are like the divine in which life is opposed to life. The ruler is then negation as quality of the will to power, which opposing life to life denies the whole of it and makes it triumph as reactive in the particular. By contrast, the other quality of the will to power is a power through which willing is adequate to the whole of life a higher power of the false, a quality through which the whole of life and its particular is affirmed and has, to, has become active. To affirm is still to evaluate, but to evaluate from the perspective of a will which enjoys its own difference in life, instead of suffering the pains of opposition to this life that it has in, itself inspired. To affirm is not to take responsibility for, to take on the burden of what is, but to relate, to set free what lives. To affirm is to unburden, not to load life with the weight of higher values, but to create new values, which are those of life, which make life light and active. There is creation, properly speaking, only insofar as we make use of the excess in order to invent new forms of life than separating life from what it can do. And you yourselves should create what you have hitherto called the world, the world should be formed in your image by your reason, your will, and your love. But this task is not completed by man, 
Going as far as he can, man raises negation to a power of affirming, but affirming in its full power, affirming affirmation itself, this is beyond man's strength. To create new values, even the lion is incapable of that, but to create itself the freedom for new creation that the lion can do. The sense of affirmation can only emerge if these fund three fundamental points in Nietzsche's philosophy are borne in mind. Not the true nor the real, but evaluation. Not affirmation as acceptance, but as creation. Not man, but the overman as a new form of life. Nietzsche attaches so much importance to art because art realizes the whole of this program, the highest power of the false. Dionysian affirmation or the genius of the superhuman. Nietzsche's argument can be summarized as follows. The yes which does not know how to say no is a caricature of affirmation. This is precisely because it says yes to everything, which is no. Because it puts up with nihilism, it continues to serve the power of denying, which is like a demon whose every burden it carries. The Dionysian yes, on the contrary, knows how to say no. It is pure affirmation. It has conquered nihilism and divested negation of all autonomous power. But it has done this because it has placed the negative at the service of the powers of affirming. To affirm is to the constitution of the eternal return. Dionysus is the first affirmation, becoming and being more precisely, the becoming which is only being as the object of a second affirmation. Ariadne is the second affirmation. Ariadne is the fiancé, the loving feminine power. Three, the labyrinth or the ears. The labyrinth is a frequent image in Nietzsche. It designates firstly the unconscious, the self, only the anima is capable of reconciling us with the unconscious of giving us a guiding thread for its exploration. In the second place, the labyrinth designates the eternal return itself. Circular, it is not the lost way, but the way which leads us back to the same point, to the same instant, which is, which was, and which will be. But more profoundly, from the perspective of the constitution of the eternal return, the labyrinth is becoming, the affirmation of becoming. Being comes from becoming. It is affirmed of becoming itself, inasmuch as the affirmation of becoming is the object of another affirmation, Ariadne's thread. As long as Ariadne remained with Theseus, the labyrinth was interpreted the wrong way around. It opened out onto higher values. The thread was the thread of the negative and resentiment, the moral thread, but Dionysus teaches Ariadne his secret. The true labyrinth is Dionysus himself. The true thread is the thread of affirmation. I am your labyrinth. <clears throat> Dionysus is the labyrinth of the bull, becoming and being. But becoming is only being insofar as affirmation is itself affirmed. Dionysus not only asks Ariadne to hear, but to affirm affirmation. You have little ears. You have my ears. Put a shrewd word there. The ear is labyrinth. The ear is the labyrinth of becoming or the maze of affirmation. The labyrinth is what leads us to being. The only being is that of becoming. The only being is that of the labyrinth itself. But Ariadne has Dionysus' ears. Affirmation must be itself affirmed so that it can be the affirmation of being. Ariadne puts a shrewd word in Dionysus' ears. That is to say, having herself heard Dionysian affirmation, she makes it the object of a second affirmation heard by Dionysus. If we understand affirmation and negation as qualities of the will to power, we see that they do not have a univo univocal relation. Negation is <clears throat> opposed to affirmation, but affirmation differs from negation. We cannot think of affirmation as being opposed to negation. We <clears throat> This would be to place the negative within it. Opposition is not only the relation of negation with affirmation, but the essence of the negative as such. Affirmation is the enjoyment and play of its own difference, as just as negation is the suffering and labor of the opposition that belongs to it, 
But what is this play of difference in affirmation? Affirmation is posited for the first time as multiplicity, becoming and chance. For multiplicity is the difference of one thing from another. Becoming is the difference from self, and chance is difference between all, or distributive difference. Affirmation is then divided into two. Difference is reflected in the affirmation of affirmation, the moment of reflection, where a second affirmation takes the first as its object. But in this way, affirmation is redoubled. As object of the second affirmation, it is affirmation itself affirmed. Redoubled affirmation, difference raised to its highest power. Becoming is being, multiplicity is unity. Chance is necessity. The affirmation of becoming is the affirmation of being, etc. But only insofar as it is the object of the second affirmation, which raises it to this new power. Being ought to belong to becoming, unity to multiplicity, necessity to chance, but only insofar as becoming multiplicity and chance are reflected in the second affirmation, which takes them as its object. It is thus the nature of affirmation to return or of difference. It is to reproduce itself. Return is the being of becoming, the unity of multiplicity, the necessity of chance, the being of difference as such or the eternal return. If we consider affirmation as a whole, we must not confuse, except for the ease of expression, the existence of two powers of affirming with the existence of two distinct affirmations. Becoming and being are a single affirmation, which only passes from one power to the other insofar as it is the object of a second affirmation. The first affirmation is Dionysus, becoming. The second affirmation is Ariadne, the mirror, the fiancé, reflection. But the second power of the first affirmation is the eternal return, or the being of becoming, the will to power as the differential element that produces, develops difference in affirmation, that reflects difference in the affirmation of affirmation, and makes it return in the affirmation which is itself affirmed. Dionysus developed, reflected, raised to the highest power. These are the aspects of Dionysian willing, which serves as principles for the eternal return. Create, not to bear. Put up with or accept. A ridiculous image of thought is formed in the head of the ass. Thinking and taking something seriously. Giving it weighty consideration. To them, these things go together. That is the only way they have experienced it. 12. The double affirmation, Ariadne. What is affirmation in all its power? Nietzsche does not do away with the concept of being. He proposes a new conception of being. Affirmation is being. Being is not the object of affirmation any more than it is an element which would present itself, which would give itself over to affirmation. Affirmation is not the power of being, on the contrary. Affirmation itself is being. Being is solely affirmation in all its power. Thus it is not surprising that Nietzsche neither analyzes being for itself, nor nothingness for itself. It should not be assumed that in this respect Nietzsche has not delivered his final thought. Being and nothingness are merely the abstract expression of affirmation and negation as qualities of the will to power. But the whole question is, what, in what sense is affirmation being? Affirmation has no object other than itself. To be precise, it is being insofar as it is its own object to itself. Affirmation is object of affirmation, that is, being. In itself and as primary affirmation, it is becoming. But it is being insofar as it is the object of affirmation, which raises becoming to being, or which extracts the being of becoming. This is why affirmation in all its power is double. Affirmation is affirmed. It is primary affirmation, becoming, which is being, but only as the object of the second affirmation. The two affirmations constitute the power of affirming as a whole. Nietzsche expresses the fact that this power is necessarily double in texts rich with important symbolic implications. 1. Zarathustra's two animals, the eagle and the serpent, interpreted from the point of view of the eternal return, the eagle is like the great cycle, the cosmic period, 
and the serpent is like the individual destiny inserted into the great period. But this precise interpretation is nevertheless insufficient because it presupposes the eternal return and says nothing about the pre-constituent elements from which it derives. The eagle flies in wide circles, a serpent wound round his neck, but not like prey, like a friend. We see here the necessity for the proudest affirmation to be accompanied paralleled by a second affirmation, which it takes as an object. Two, the divine couple, Dionysus and Ariadne. Who besides me knows what Ariadne is? The mystery of Ariadne has without a doubt a plurality of senses. Ariadne loved Theseus. Theseus is a representation of the higher man. He is the sublime heroic man, the one who takes up burdens and defeats monsters. But what he lacks is precisely the virtue of the bull, that is to say the sense of the earth when he is harnessed and also the capacity to unharshness, to throw off burdens. As long as woman loves man, as long as she is mother, sister, wife of man, even if he is the higher man, she is only the feminine image of man. The feminine power remains fettered in man. As terrible mothers, terrible sisters, and wives, femininity represents the spirit of revenge and this resentiment which animates man himself. But Ariadne, abandoned by Theseus, senses the coming of a transmutation which is specific to her. The feminine power emancipated become beneficent and affirmative. The anima. Let the flash of a star glitter in your love. Let your hope be. May I bear the overman. Moreover, in relation to Dionysus, Ariadne anima is like this, a second affirmation. Dionysian affirmation demands another affirmation which takes it as its object. Dionysian becoming is being enmity, but only insofar as the corresponding affirmation is itself affirmed. Eternal affirmation of being. Eternally, I am your affirmation. The eternal return is the closest approximation of being and becoming. It affirms the one of the other. A second affirmation is still necessary in order to bring about this approximation. This is why the eternal return itself is a wedding ring. This is why the Dionysian universe, the eternal cycle, is a wedding ring, a wedding mirror which awaits the soul, capable of admiring itself there, but also reflecting it in admiring itself. Another development of the image of betrothal and the wedding ring. This is why Dionysus wants a fiancé. It is me, me that you want, the whole me. Here again, it will be noticed that depending on the point at which one is placed, the wedding changes sense or partners. For according to the constituted eternal return, Zarathustra appears the fiancé and eternity as the woman loved. But according... 13. <clears throat> Dionysus and Zarathustra. The lesson of the eternal return is that there is no return of the negative. The eternal return means that being is selection. Only that which affirms or is affirmed returns. The eternal return is the reproduction of becoming, but the reproduction of becoming is also the production of becoming active. Child of Dionysus and Ariadne. In the eternal return, being ought to belong to becoming but the being of becoming ought to belong to a single becoming active. Nietzsche's speculative teaching is as follows. Becoming, multiplicity, and chance do not contain any negation. Difference is pure affirmation. Return is the being of difference, excluding the whole of the negative. And this teaching would perhaps remain obscure without the pra practical clarity in which it is steeped. Nietzsche exposes all the mystifications which disfigure philosophy, the apparatus of bad conscience, the false marvels of the negative which turn multiplicity, becoming chance and difference itself into so many misfortunes of consciousness itself, and turn misfortunes of consciousness into so many moments of formation, reflection, or development. Nietzsche's practical teaching is that difference is happy, that multiplicity becoming in chance are adequate objects of joy by themselves and that only joy returns. Multiplicity becoming in chance are the properly philosophical joy in which unity rejoices in itself 
and also in being and necessity. Not since Lucretius has the critical enterprise which characterizes philosophy been taken so far, with the exception of Spinoza. Lucretius exposes the trouble of the soul and those who need it to establish their power. Spinoza exp exposes sorrow, all the causes of sorrow, and all those who found their power at the heart of this sorrow. Nietzsche exposes resentiment, bad conscience, and the power of the negative which serves as their principle, the untimeliness of a philosophy which has liberation as its object. There is no unhappy consciousness which is not also man's enslavement a trap for the will and an opportunity for all baseness of thought. The reign of the negative is the reign of the powerful beasts, churches and states which fetter us to their own ends. The murderer of God committed a sad crime because his motivation was sad. He wanted to take God's place. He killed in order to steal. He remained in the negative whilst taking on the attributes of divinity. The death of God needs time, finally, to find its essence and become a joyful event. Time to expel the negative, to exercise the reactive. The time of a becoming active. This time is the cycle of the eternal return. The negative expires at the gates of being. Opposition ceases its labor, and difference begins its play. But is there any being which does not belong to another world, and how is the selection made? Nietzsche calls the point of conversion of the negative transmutation. The negative loses its power and quality. Negation ceases <clears throat> to be an autonomous power. That is to say, a quality of the will to power. Transmutation relates the negative to affirmation in the will to power. It is turned into a simple mode of being of the powers of affirming. Instead of the labor of opposition or the suffering of the negative, we have the warlike play of difference, affirmation, and the joy of destruction. The no stripped of its power, transformed into the opposite quality, turned affirmative and creative. Such is transmutation. This transmutation of values is what essentially defines Zarathustra. If Zarathustra passes through the negative, as his disgusts and temptations show, it is not in order to make use of it as a motor, nor to take on its burden or product, but to reach the point where the motor is changed, the product surmounted, and the whole of the negative vanquished or transmuted. Zarathustra's whole story is contained in his relationship with nihilism, that is to say, with the demon. The demon is the spirit of the negative, the power of denying which plays several apparently opposed roles. Sometimes he gets man to carry him, suggesting to him that the weight he is burdened with is positivity itself. Sometimes, on the contrary, he jumps over man, taking all forces and will from him. The contradiction is only apparent. In the first case, man is the reactive being who wants to seize power, to substitute his own strength for the power which dominates him. But in, the, in fact, the demon finds the opportunity here to get himself carried, to get himself taken on to pursue his task, disguised by a false positivity. In the second case, man is the last man, still a reactive being. He no longer has the strength to take possession of willing. The demon takes all of man's strength and leaves him without strength or will. In both cases, the demon appears as the spirit of the negative, which, through all the avatars of man, preserves his power and keeps his quality. He stands for the will to nothingness, which makes use of man as a reactive being, which gets itself carried by him, but at which at the same time does not fuse with him and jumps over. From all of these points of view, transmutation differs from the will to nothingness, just as Zarathustra differs from his demon. With Zarathustra, negation loses its power and quality. Beyond the reactive man, there is the destroyer of known values. Beyond the last man, there is the man who wants to perish or to be overcome. Zarathustra stands for affirmation. The spirit of affirmation is the power which turns the negative into a mode and man and into an active being who wants to be overcome, not jumped over. Zarathustra's sign is the sign of the lion. The first book of Zarathustra opens with the lion and the last closes with it. But the lion is precisely the holy no become creative and affirmative. 
This know which only affirmation knows how to say, in the, which the whole of the negative is converted, transmuted in power and quality. With transmutation, the will to power ceases to be fettered to the negative as the ratio by which it is known to us. It reveals its unknown face, the unknown raison d'etre which makes the negative a simple mode of being. Zarathustra has, moreover, a complex relation to Dionysus, as transmutation does to the eternal return. In a certain way, Zarathustra is cause of the eternal return and father of the overman. The man who wants to perish, the man who wants to be overcome, is the ancestor and father of the overman, the destroyer of all known values. The lion of the holy no prepares its final metamorphosis. It becomes a child. And with his hands thrust into the lion's fleece, Zarathustra feels that his children are near, or that the overman is approaching. But in what his but in what sense is Zarathustra father of the overman and cause of the eternal return? In the sense of a precondition. In another way, the eternal return has an unconditioned principle to which Zarathustra himself is subject. From the perspective of the principle which conditions it, the eternal return depends on transmutation, but, from the perspective of its unconditioned principle, transmutation depends more profoundly on the eternal return. Zarathustra is subject to Dionysus. Who and I, I await one who is more worthy. I am not worthy even to break myself against him. In the trinity of the Antichrist, Dionysus, Ariadne, and Zarathustra, Zarathustra is Ariadne's conditional fiancé, but Ariadne is Dionysus' unconditioned fiancé. This is why Zarathustra is always in an inferior position in relation to the eternal return and the overman. He is the cause of the eternal return, but a cause which delays producing its effect, a prophet who hesitates to deliver his message, who knows the vertigo and the temptation of the negative, who must be encouraged by his animals father of the overman, but a father whose products are ripe before he is ripe for his products, a lion who still lacks a final metamorphosis. In fact, the eternal return and the overman are the crossing of two genealogies, of two unequal genetic lines. On the one hand, they relate to Zarathustra as to the conditioning principle which posits them in merely hypothetical manner. On the other hand, they relate to Dionysus as the unconditioned principle, which is the basis of their apodeotic and absolute character. Thus, in Zarathustra's, <clears throat> Zarathustra's exposition, it is always the entanglement of causes or the connection of moments. The synthetic relation of moments to each other, which determines the hypothesis of the return at the same moment. But from Dionysus' perspective, by contrast, it is the synthetic relation of the moment to itself as past, present, and to come, which absolutely determines its relations with all the other moments. The return is not the passion of one moment pushed by others, but the activity of the moment which determined the others in being itself determined through what it affirms. Zarathustra's constellation is the constellation of the lion, but that of Dionysus is the constellation of being. The yes of the child player is more profound than the holy no of the lion. The whole of Zarathustra is affirmative, <clears throat> even when he who knows how to say no says no. But Zarathustra is not the whole of the affirmation, nor what is most profound about it. Zarathustra relates the negative to affirmation in the will to power. It, still is, it is still necessary for the will to power to be related to affirmation as its raison d'etre, and for affirmation to be related to the will to power as the element which produces, reflects, and develops its own ratio. This is the task of Dionysus. All affirmation finds its condition in Zarathustra, but its unconditioned principle in Dionysus. Zarathustra determines the eternal return. Moreover, he determines it to produce its effect, the overman. But this determination is the same as the series of conditions which finds its final term in the lion, in the man who wants to be overcome, in the destroyer of all known values. 
Dionysus' determination is of another kind, identical to the absolute principle without which the conditions would be themselves remain powerless. And without, <clears throat> and this is Dionysus' supreme disguise to subject his products to conditions which are themselves conditioned to him, subject to him conditions that these products themselves surpass. The lion becomes a child. The destruction of known values makes possible a creation of new values. But the creation of values, the yes of the child player, would not be formed under these conditions if they were not, at the same time, subject to a deeper genealogy. It is no surprise, therefore, to find that every Nietzschean concept lies at the crossing of two unequal genetic lines. Not only the eternal return in the overman, but laughter, play, and dance. In relation to Zarathustra laughter, play and dance are affirmative powers of transmutation. Dance transmu transmutes heavy into light, laughter transmutes suffering into joy, and the play of throwing the dice transmutes low into high. But in relation to the Dionysus dance, laughter and play are affirmative powers of reflection and development. Dance affirms becoming and the being of becoming. Laughter, roars of laughter, affirm multiplicity and the unity of multiplicity. Play affirms the chance and the necessity of chance. Conclusion <clears throat> Modern philosophy presents us with amalgams which testify to its vigor and vitality, but which also have their dangers for the spirit. A strange mixture of ontology and anthropology, of atheism and theology, a little Christian spiritualism, a little Hegelian dialectic, a little, phenomena, a little phenomenology, our modern scholasticism, and a little Nietzschean figuration, oddly combined in varying portions. We see Marx and the pre-Socratics, Hegel and Nietzsche, dancing hand in hand in a round celebration of the surpassing of metaphysics and even the death of philosophy, properly speaking. And it is true that Nietzsche did intend to go beyond metaphysics, but so did Jerry in what invoking etymology he calls pataphysics. We have imagined Nietzsche withdrawing his stake from a game which is not his own. Nietzsche called the philosophers and philosophy of his time the portrayal of all that has ever been believed. He might say the same of today's philosophy, where Nietzscheanism, Hegelianism, and Husserlianism are the scraps of the new gaudily painted canvas of modern thought. <clears throat> there is no possible compromise between Hegel and Nietzsche. Nietzsche's philosophy has a great polemical range. It forms an absolute anti-dialectics and sets out to expose all the mystifications that find a final refuge in the dialectic. What Schopenhauer dreamed of but did not carry out, caught as he was in the net of Kantianism and pessimism, Nietzsche carries out at the price of his break with Schopenhauer, setting up a new image of thought, freeing thought from the burdens which are crushing it. Three ideas define the dialectic. The idea of a power of the negative as a theoretical principle manifested in opposition and contradiction. The idea that suffering and sadness have value. The valorization of the sad passions as a practical principle manifested in splitting and tearing apart. The idea of positivity as a theoretical and practical product of negation itself. It is no exaggeration to say that the whole of Nietzsche's philosophy, in its polemical sense, is the attack on these three ideas. If the speculative element of the dialectic is found in opposition and contradiction, this is primarily because it reflects a false image of difference. Like the eye of the ox, it reflects an inverted image of difference. The Hegelian dialectic is indeed a reflection on difference, but it inverts its image. For the affirmation of difference as such, it substitutes the negation of that which differs. For the affirmation of self, it substitutes the negation of the other. And for the affirmation of affirmation, it substitutes the famous negation of the negation. But this inversion would be meaningless if it were not in fact animated by forces with an interest in doing so. The dialectic expresses every combination of reactive forces and nihilism the history or evolution of their relations. 
Opposition substituted for difference is also the triumph of the reactive forces that find their corresponding principle in the will to nothingness. Resentiment needs negative premises, two negations, in order to produce a phantom of affirmation. The ascetic ideal needs resentiment itself and bad conscience, just like the conjurer needs his marked cards. Everywhere there are sad passions. The unhappy consciousness is the subject of the whole dialectic. The dialectic is, first of all, the thought of the theoretical man, reacting against life, claiming to judge life, to limit and to measure it. In the second place, it is the thought of the priest which subjects life to the labor of the negative. He needs negation to establish his power. He represents the strange will which leads reactive forces to triumph. Dialectic in this sense is the authentically Christian ideology. Finally, it is the thought of the slave expressing reactive life in itself and the becoming reactive of the universe. Even the atheism that it offers us is a clerical atheism. Even its image of the master is a slavish one. It is not surprising that the dialectic only produces a phantom of affirmation, whether as overcome position or as resolved contradiction. The image of positivity is radically falsified. Dialectical positivity from the real is the dialectic, the yes of the ass. The ass knows how to affirm because it takes things upon itself, but it only takes on the products of the negative. For the demon, Zarathustra's ape, it is sufficient to jump on our shoulders. Those who carry are always tempted to think that by carrying they affirm, and that the positive is assessed by weight. The ass in a lion's skin. This is what Nietzsche calls the man of the present. Nietzsche's greatness was to know how to separate these two plants, resentiment and bad conscience. If this, were the, if this were its only aspect, Nietzsche's philosophy would be of the greatest importance. But in his work, polemic is only the aggression which derives from a deeper active and affirmative instance. Dialectic emerged from Kantian critique, from false critique. Carrying out a true critique implies philosophy which develops itself for itself and only returns the negative as a mode of being. Nietzsche reproaches the dialecticians for going no further than an abstract conception of universal and particular. They were prisoners of symptoms and did not reach the forces or the will which gave these sense and value. They moved within the limits of the question, what is? The contrary question par excellence. Nietzsche creates his own method, dramatic, typological, and differential. He turns philosophy into an art, the art of interpreting and evaluating. In every case, he asks the question, which one? The one that is Dionysus. That which is the will to power as plastic and genealogical principle. The will to power is not force, but the differential element which simultaneously determines the relation of forces, quantity, and the respective qualities of related forces. It is in this element of difference that affirmation manifests itself and develops itself as creative. The will to power is the principle of multiple affirmation, the donor principle or the bestowing virtue. The sense of Nietzsche's philosophy is that multiplicity becoming in chance are objects of pure affirmation. The affirmation of multiplicity is the speculative proposition, just as the joy of diversity is the practical proposition. The player only loses because he does not affirm strongly enough, because he introduces the negative into chance and opposition into becoming and multiplicity. The pure dice throw necessarily produces the winning number, which reproduces the dice throw. We affirm chance and the necessity of chance, becoming and the being of becoming, multiplicity and the unity of multiplicity. Affirmation turns back on itself, then returns once more, carried to its highest power. Difference reflects itself and repeats or reproduces itself. The eternal return is this highest power, the synthesis of affirmation, which finds its principle in the will, the lightness of that which affirms against the weight of the negative the games of the will to power against the labor of the dialectic, the affirmation of affirmation against the famous negation of the negation. Negation, it is true, appears primarily as a quality of the will to power, but in the sense that the reaction is a quality of force, 
More profoundly, negation is only one face of the will to power, the face by which it is known to us. Insofar as knowledge itself is the expression of relative reactive forces, man inhabits only the dark side of the earth, of which he only understands the becoming reactive which permeates and constitutes it, which is why the history of man is that of nihilism, negation, and reaction. But the